There's no time. No. The time is... 13. O'clock. Hey, everybody. Hey, you got your Flock of Seagull shirt on. Yeah. I even noticed that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wasn't looking at it. It's like you have a lot of black t-shirts with white shit on them, so it's like I wasn't really sure I which one it was. That's true. So, yeah, here we are. It's Wednesday night coming to you live from Hurricane Ian. <laughs> yeah. It's just starting to come. It's yeah. not, yeah. I mean, we're... Um, I don't know if you guys know. Like, you know, most of us, most of you guys know we're in Florida. We are about... What are, like, about 25, 30 miles north and slightly west of Orlando? Like, yeah. downtown Orlando? It's going to hit us. It's going to hit us, but yeah. I think we're not going to get the worst of it. No. I, I have been, like, watching the shit from, like, Naples and, uh, you know, <coughs> down there, like, where it came on land. And it's like, that shit looks fucked up. It's all flooded down there. Yeah, it's, uh... It's probably going to end up being a bunch of rain and about 70 or 80 mile an hour winds. Which is bad, but it's yeah, not uh, But it's not as bad as like what they got down there, because yeah. man, that already looks all fucked up. Yeah. Everybody's we got a, houses are floating away. We got about a 50% chance of losing power. And, yeah, so... Usually it's not for long. I just hope it does. Yeah, usually it's not for long. A couple hours. I was, like I said, I was looking at the shit from Naples, and all I could think was all those people's houses. I'm like, oh my god, they're never going to be able to move back in those houses now, mm. because they're just like flooded up to the roofs. Storm surge, man. Yeah. But yeah, so hopefully it doesn't get too bad. Hopefully we keep the power. It's kind of like it's raining out and it's kind of windy. Like every now and then it gusts mm. really loud. Yeah. But that's about it. But I'm just kind of hoping that we can at least. Yeah, Granther said Naples is foobar. Yeah, everything yeah. I saw of it, it definitely looks. Yeah, uh, I got I got word through my aunt that my dad wanted me to call him. You know, I called him. He goes, that thing going to hit you. It's coming <laughs> straight for you. And I know you ain't got no supplies. And I know you're going to be without power. And he's going to go through the whole thing. It's like, and what are you talking about? No supplies. I was like, we got all kind of two. food. We got generators. Yeah. Oh, we got, oh, oh, you do? We got, ga oh. <laughs> we got gasoline. Oh. oh, okay. All right. We got <laughs> yeah, he's like that, you know. Does, he, does he still think that you're a child or something? No, he just... It's and like that, just you how don't. he is, you know. I know you fucking it up. He's like, well, he's just like that, you know. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Yeah, he's, you know, that's, how, that's how Dad is. I know you didn't plan. I know it just hit you, you know. I know you don't have any generators. He says, no, I got all. I got two generators. Oh, you do. We've had yeah. a couple generators yeah. like for a while because we got. They're hit brand by, new. I mean, we had one before, yeah. like because we had a hurricane hit us like a couple yeah. of years back. And that, that second one that I got could run the old house the entire thing yeah the entire thing including the central air system that's how powerful that one is it could probably run this but i got two i got two central systems but they don't run at the same time i bet you'd run i bet you'd run them yeah I and i mean like i said we have um you know i don't have the hookup though we have window units yeah. though so we can like at least put it in the bedroom and the office yeah. um and use and maybe we could run like the wi-fi and the freezers and the fridge so we don't lose all the food and shit i never got around to installing the hookup in this house well it's too expensive y'all didn't give me enough super chats <laughs> try to guilt everybody yeah yeah because yeah, <laughs> nice. it, it would have cost like two grand to get the hookups well, I, I do to not, do both I do generators. So I'd have two of them bad boys. Two of them bad boys running out. Well, it's no use to like crying about it now. Boys. It's too late now. That's right. And then I'd fucking try to build a damn iron cage around them so no one could steal them. With fucking bulletproof glass and electric <laughs> eyes and proximity And a alerts. dragon sitting on Dragons top of it. and shit. <laughs> when you get close to my fucking generators, it fucking beats my cell phone or run down there with an AR and light your fucking ass up fucking being on my goddamn property in a damn state of emergency and shit. Just bury you out in the backyard. All the neighbors watching. Who'd you shoot? It'd be fucking funny. Ben says, front page story this morning was how this hurricane will be the worst ever and depopulate Florida. Yeah, it's yeah, like, it's all uh, it's well, all I mean, all the people that moved down here are probably like, oh, yeah, this yeah. kind of kinda sucks. A lot of that's hate, you know what I mean? They want to see us get hit real bad because they don't like our governor. Nobody that's said that. I didn't yeah, say that. Like, oh, didn't Florida's going oh, to be fucked well, up. Well, the thing about oh. well, Florida is going to be fucked up. Yeah, but the thing about it is that, well. It always happens. Not here. But, yeah, it's like, I mean, this is the worst one that's hit here for probably like 30, 40 years. Yeah. I don't remember one 
where it's hitting though, where it's hitting is uh, probably gonna be okay though. It's it's a lot worse if it hits the very tip. My understanding. It's easier to flood there. We'll see. Anyways. Well, it's like I said, Naples is already flooded. Yeah. I already saw the yeah. shit. Because yeah. you know that's just gonna happen though. Well, yeah, but I'm just saying it's not good yeah. though. I'm mean, like, yeah. that was your house. But the thing about it, if, are if you're gonna move to Florida, better, I, yeah. I would not advise yeah. buying a house if you no. could afford it. I would not no. advise buying a house on. Actually, I would not Nothing advise. Nothing coastal. I would not advise like moving to Florida anyway. But I'm just, I would not advise like buying anything on the coast because <laughs> eventually your number's gonna come up. Your number's gonna come up eventually. Well. I wouldn't. I would never say don't move to Florida. Move to Florida if you want to move to Florida. Well, yeah, does, just, I'm just making a what joke. The, what the rules are? I'm here. just saying, yeah, 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 that it's like if you're not real into because this happens yeah. every year. We don't yep. get a bad one like this every year. Yeah. Like this is the you worst one in a while. You guys see me fucking but... prepping and shit, and I got all prepping survival stuff. It's not all just because of apocalypse. This is the fucking Gulf. This is the Gulf. All right. It's not just Florida, Mississippi too, Louisiana, Alabama, Panhandle. You're going to get hit by hurricanes. That's just how it is. Every uh, My whole time living down here. Well, I've li lived home, here my whole life, so my yeah. My old homestead got of fucking them. annihilated by Katrina. You know, good. I wasn't there at the time. But past Christian, Gulfport, Biloxi got hit fucking hard. Fucked them up. But they came right back. I mean, it takes a while, Can't like I said. Yeah, I, actually, the worst one I remember in Florida that yeah. I remember, like, I wasn't there, but it was Andrew. That was yeah. Miami and uh, yeah. down there. New Orleans got it, got it much worse than fucking Gulf, Gulf Coast of Mississippi during Katrina. But the fucking, the rest of the coast got fucked up, too. Wasn't as bad as Katrina. I mean, you had, wasn't as bad as New Orleans. A lot of people ran from New Orleans and went to Gulfport and Biloxi for safety, even though it was fucked up there, too. Just not as fucked up as... New Orleans. Yes. New Orleans is in a damn bowl. It just floods. It floods. That's what it does. And, you know, I don't mean to be brutal, but if you live in New Orleans, you're, you've are you signed on. You're going to get flooded. Well, I mean, you, it's not, you should know. And it's you should the, know. And it's the right. same thing about moving to Florida. I mean, I know that some people were like me or like born here and you're kind of like stuck there, like you can't afford to move or whatever, but it's just kind of like Florida too. All of Florida, I don't know if you guys know this, all of Florida is right at sea level. We don't have any hills or nothing like that. So, like, if, you know, shit goes up, the whole fucking state's going underwater pretty much. Yeah. Now, I, you know, I was there. I was there for Katrina. I was up in Baton Rouge area. It was fucking bad. Real bad. I was in support for the fucking state police, keeping them bitches running during all that fucking emergency. Fuck, man. It was inhuman. Cops were just walking off the job. They're, like, fucking crying and shit. Couldn't take it. All the weird shit that was happening, watching people just getting wiped out, fucking buildings filled with fucking dead old people and stuff. You know, those old well, that's what homes. I'm kind of worried about too, because yeah. then, like they were talking about it, like on some of the news yeah. things that I was watching, they said, you know, a lot of the people, well, a lot of people live in South Florida are like old people. Yeah. And they can't really they can't run from it. Evacuate because they, they did tell everybody yeah. to evacuate, but yeah. obviously there's going to be people. Yeah. That everybody run. starts running. The cops start running. Everybody's running. It's just the fucking. It's like the Walking Dead. And it's just. And if you're if you're infirm or old or dumb you're left behind and you die just just but that's it you know what i mean now some people say well could, you know new orleans shouldn't have been hit because of the the, the levees and shit the levees broke just like that led zeppelin song. yeah the levees broke but the thing is is that if you signed on to new orleans you know that those levees fucking suck anyway all right Shit was fucking built by contractors, fucking the lowest fucking bidding fucking contractor. It's always, it's, it was held to get, New Orleans is, for hundreds of years, New Orleans was held to get together with spit, tape, and bailing wire. It was just made up as it went. The shit was built on fucking cotton bales. <laughs> and then the cotton bales all rotted. You know? A lot of people don't know that. But that's how they fucking filled that damn swamp to build the area as it got bigger cotton bales well the thing like i said that's the thing about florida too yeah. is that a lot of florida before they started developing it was a swamp mm -hmm. and probably should have stayed a swamp to be yeah. honest with you because yeah. it's like it's a constant kind of constant struggle of shit where where we used to live over in sanford yeah. every time it didn't even have to be a hurricane it was just yeah. like a regular everyday like uh summer storm you'd walk up the path and like people's yards be totally flooded and it yeah. would and it would be flooded for like days and days and days yeah. Where we live right now, it looks like a golf course with a bunch of nice houses and stuff, and then around it, a bunch of um, 
cattle farms and cattle ranches and horse ranches. It's it's pretty here. Hopefully a little cows but if and you horses go, aren't going to blow yeah, away. Yeah, but if you just go three or four miles, uh, six miles up this road, you'll go over a bridge, and if you look to the right, it looks like the Amazon fucking basin. It looks like the fucking Amazon jungle. And that's what... It, it's just a weird mix, and it's all happening and all in one spot. It just looks... You'll see... It looks like you're in fucking Nebraska, and two seconds later, it looks like you're in Dagobah. That's how quickly it changes. Yeah, like I said, it's a big fucking swamp. Yeah, swamps. Florida's a swamp, pretty much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's Swamp Beach. That's about it. Yeah, and then and Disney. Then they, and then try to build stuff over, and Disney used to be a swamp, Disney. too. Yeah. That's just, they just, yeah. like, piled some dirt on it and then built yeah. the theme park. Disney is Dagobah. They just masked over it. If you yeah. look outside Disney, you go, God damn. Yeah. It looks like something out of damn Pirates of Carib Caribbean ride. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it does, and it smells like that too. Yeah. Uh, Danny Rowling said, "What's your favorite MRE meal to eat?" Oh, the, well, I only had the old ones. A lot of the new ones I've never had. Like they got taco in there and pizza and shit. I've never had any of that. Well, what's your favorite out of the old? The ones, old though? ones. <sighs> Barbecue pork and rice. Really? That was good. They don't have that anymore. I think they're all halal now. All right. Back in the day, they didn't play that. Your bit, your ass was eating pork. All right. It was it fucking. Back in those days, the fucking the the United States Army was a Southern Army. It was all fucking rednecks and shit. Rednecks and fucking Southern blacks and whites with some Hispanics. Okay, and Island boys. You know, guys from fucking Guam and Hawaii and Micronesia and fucking Polynesia and fucking all. They were in there too, and they everybody ate pork. Fucking, it was a pork loving army. But so I like that barbecue pork was good. With rice, probably can't get it anymore. Um, ham slice was real good because it, it was just a block of fucking ham in brine. <clears throat> I liked the omelet. Most people didn't like it, but I liked the omelet. It was a brick of cooked eggs with uh, something in there. Ham or sausage. I don't remember. Mystery meat. Ham. Yeah, mystery meat. Um... I liked them all, man. I did. I liked them all. And everybody was talking bad about chicken a la king. I'd fucking get... I'd, I'd have a whole fucking rucksack full of chicken a la king. I liked it. Nobody else liked it. But I would cook with it, you know? Mix your crackers in there and your fucking hot sauce. Because each of those little things came in little bitty Tabasco, glass Tabasco fucking bottles and shit. We had classy MREs back in the day. That was back before the MRE heater. We had those two later on where you added the water. But they they kind of sucked. We would cook that shit with a heat tab, man, over a fucking um, canteen cup. Cooking a canteen cup, which went around your canteen. It was metal, had handles on it. You put, a, make a little hole and put a little... We had a little canteen cup fucking holder. It would slip around there, and you could put it upside down, put a heat tab in there. It was like dried sterno, and you could catch it on fire and fucking put it in there. I got a bunch of those. I like the old school shit. It was, it's better than the high tech shit. As shit went on, let me tell you bitches something. As the, as the U.S. Army evolved, it got more and more pussy. Uh, the, uh, the, the operations became more and more law enforcement like, and they were all kind of, most of them were deploying from vehicles. So the equipment that they gave them was less and less, less and less field survival and more and more cop like. So they lost out on a lot of stuff. They had to open up new schools like Jungle Warfare and shit like that, LRSD schools, to teach dudes how to be a fucking soldier and live off the land and fucking be out for fucking 70 days with a rucksack and fucking just surviving, you know? They, most of them didn't do that. The, the nature of the war changed, and the nature of the equipment that they gave them was started to be oriented around vehicles, not just walking around Mad Max-style living. You know, like Conan. Mr. 88 said, Miss Chats for the past month have been watching after the fact. You may not have missed me, but I missed you. No, well, thank you. Of course, you. we always miss you guys when you don't show up. Mm -hmm. Actually, a lot of the people, we still miss you. We miss Tila. We miss Sandra, the peanut butter girl. Yeah. We don't know what happened to her. They got killed. They've shut up. No, they didn't. No, it's not bad. <laughs> they got killed. That's nice. <laughs> you're so, you're so like cool to hang out with, Tom. You're yeah. like always so positive when and Tina cheerful. When Tina was up in San Francisco, the high mortality rate there. Sandra's in Germany. I'm they sure think, she's fine. Sandra's in Germany. They're freezing to death. They don't I'm have. I'm sure any, they're fine. They don't have any oil or anything. I'm sure they're fine. We'll see, Tom. 
I'm sure they're Let's see, they're gonna have to speak up. I'm sure that it's just something like, oh, I don't, I got a new job and I don't have yeah. time to like, it's all, it's almost always something <coughs> mundane, you know what I mean? Almost <coughs> always. They got killed. Yeah, great. Mm. Are you gonna be in one of those kind of moods mm. tonight? Cause that's, cause this is no I'm point. on trend. Well, yeah. Yeah. Great. It's gonna be all right. <laughs> So, yeah, so we got all this topic that has nothing to do with either the hurricane or the topic of tonight's show. But I was what, answering what else is new? It's all good. Uh, We're just waiting for everybody to show up. Actually, it's, we can start. Mr. Uh, Mr. 88 said Florida is low. Yeah, it is. If the sea level rises just two or three inches, something like 75% of Florida will be underwater. Yep, that's right. That's right. That um, so my, my, home, uh, my hometown of Daytona Beach would uh, be underwater. Yes, it would. <coughs> No big loss. <laughs> I'm not being an asshole. It would take a long. I got time. I got like family that live there. I'm just. It joking. would take a long time for that to happen. I'm You'd just see joking. the water coming over. It happen over fucking generations. You just walk out of here, like it always does. Mrs. Evans already party said, "Where is that rock hand? Where is that mm. rock hand? Where is that rock hand? There it is, right there. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I keep forgetting I have that. Yeah. I went to all the trouble to make that, and then like I forgot that I had it, and because like, <clears throat> it's right there, like in my little like video thingy. Yep. But yeah, so I'm just saying the the weather seems to be holding up right now, but you know, if you're arriving late, we are in Florida. Uh Hurricane Ian is about 3 or 4 hours south of here, so if the power goes out, you'll know what happened, but I think it's okay for now. I think it's okay for now. <laughs> Mrs. Evans already party said, "Fuck yes." But yeah, so, uh, oh, before we get too much into it, I wanted to do a couple of thank yous. I think I already thanked um, Dermot, who is uh, one of our friends of the show and one of our patrons from the UK. And he sent me a very generous uh, PayPal donation for my birthday. So thank you very much, Dermot. Also, I want to thank uh, Miguel, who also gave me a, uh, a very nice donation or birthday present. Like, uh, So thank you very much, thank Miguel. Thank you guys very much. Also, Esther, who is a friend of the show and uh, one of our patrons, actually sent me a message on Patreon and was you know, uh, saying she was going to send us some movies and posters and stuff. And she's like, she's going to wait till the storm passes. Okay. Just because, yeah, they're, I mean, they're kind of closing stuff up. And we got mail today, but I don't know about tomorrow. No, I probably won't get it tomorrow. Because I know that Amazon is, like, closing some of their warehouses and stuff around here, so I don't know if we're going to, like, get any and stuff. I, but, she, but she, like, gave me her uh, phone number and stuff like that and said, hey, if you guys need anything, like, uh, I ordered new know. frames, man, for these lenses. I can pop them out and change them. Fucking, I've been wearing fucking glasses that has one side to it for fucking a week. Still waiting on my, my shit to show up. What do you want me to do about it? Why don't you get out there and speed that mail up for me? Uh, yeah, okay. Get I'll, I'll get I'll get right get out on there that. With a sign, start waving it. I'll get right sign. on that. You just hold Good. your breath and wait. <laughs> so well, no, you guys see me on the show doing this weird ass shit like this all the time? It's because my fucking glasses broke. You seriously don't have another pair? No, I don't kidding. No, they they're broke too. How you down keep, to my how last you keep one. Breaking them. I don't know. I've had this pair and another pair of reading glasses for like for a couple of years. Well, I had those for a couple of years too. And oh, it's like one. I didn't break them. Actually, I didn't break the other ones. I just lost them. I think I left them at the um, at the club one night because they fell out of my purse. That's army birth control glasses. Yeah. Birth control. Yeah. Okay. I control birth every time I put these things on. How about Ernie? Yeah, do you control Ernie? Do too. You control yeah. Ernie all and I hadn't had any children since they gave these fucking things to me, so they're working. <laughs> okay. Can't get laid in that shit. <laughs> That's fucking, right. Yeah. Fucking VA. <laughs> VA gave them to me, man. I like those glasses, actually. They all look like that dude off a of fucking uh, uh, off that fucking Sicario movie. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> They're all like cricket and crazy. Yeah, like well, I only got one side. <laughs> but... <laughs> My dad would make a comment over some shit like that. Why you only got one side on them thing? <laughs> <laughs> he did. He said, well, you'd be like, wow, you're, re you're real observant. Yeah, let me see that. You only got one side on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for stating it obvious. You did. You knew then. Yeah, I knew. You know, that shit. I know. It's like, I love that, the way they're telling you like they like you don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's they're sitting on my face. Yeah. It's like, I'm, I'm pretty well aware. It was that generation. <laughs> <laughs> that, what they think everyone else is an idiot? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. I guess they're just you're giving them an opportunity to say something. Well, maybe that's what it is because yeah. he did like when you called him yesterday, yeah. and he said, "I bet you don't have anything for yeah. the hurricane, even though we have all the shit for yeah. the hurricane." Yeah, I got candles, like yeah. flashlights. We got everything. Yeah, I know you're fucking up. 
You know, that's the attitude. Yeah. They I, yeah. I kind of feel like that yeah. generation thinks everyone younger than them is stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're their children. That's what I'm saying. And, like, I was talking to my mom. Like, my mom doesn't. Like, my mom is awesome, and she uh, is not like that at all. But she is kind of like, well, she's like, that's the thing. I mean, and my mom is, like, 68. Like, yeah. I think she just turned 68. But she's like, even, like, as old as your kids get, you still think of them as your babies, like, as yeah. your kids. So it's really hard for them to pop into another mindset that this is, like, another adult. Mm-hmm. That can do the same adult shit that you can do. Yeah. So they do come, kind of come across like that, like your parents. Yeah. Well, it's fucking. You know, I called me the, that thing coming straight towards you. I it's, mean, not it exactly. sees you. You know, it sees you. <laughs> it sees you. It's coming it's right for you specifically. Yeah, yeah. It sees you. That's like some shit. Like, <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I'm gonna have to go down and see him soon. He ain't gonna make it much longer. He's not. He's not doing good. Yeah, he was he talking about. He told that. me, yeah, you better come down and see me before I die. I'm sick of this. That's what he basically what he said. I'm not gonna make it much longer. Yeah, because he. Well, you talked yeah. to him a long time on the phone yesterday, yeah. and then you came in back in and said, "Hey, like after the beginning of the month, I might like." I might have to go down there and go visit. out there and visit him. Cause... Yeah, I ride up there on a the bike. It's only six. It's only about eight hours. Yeah, I think it's hours. like about an eight hour drive. I, yeah, I'll, drive. I'll ride up there, man. I can yeah, it was like a, it's a lot cheaper than fucking flying. I'm sure. Well, then I gotta rent a car. Well, yeah, so, what did you just ride your I fucking hate that shit. I like to do my shit on my own, you know? Yeah, I get that. I'll buy I some, do, too. I'll buy a saddlebag kit for that fucking Buell. A couple hundred bucks. I mean, it only take a day. That. It would only take a day. Not even. Yeah, like, not even a day. It's not. That's a, that's a work shift, and I would fucking stop halfway and get something to eat. Yeah, that's what I'm it's saying. Like a four hour and four hours. As long as the weather was was okay, like it wasn't <laughs> raining or nothing. Well, like I that. got equipment for all that. I don't give a shit about wet weather. Yeah, I'm just saying. I don't give a shit. And it's not like I got to be there by any amount of time. I would just take my time. Right. You know? That's what I'm saying. It'd yeah. be much easier. Because, yeah. like I said, the dumbass thing is, like, even if you flew there, I mean, I think the flight's only, like, a, maybe not even an hour. But by the yeah. time you get to the airport and, and get the fact, car for and rent a week, the, it'd probably like, take yeah. the same amount of time. And it would cost, like, fucking three or four times as much. So. Yeah. And then it, it, if it, I was you, I would drive. It would drive. be all that I car would, rental bullshit. Yeah. And then I would have to fly in. To somewhere in New Orleans, in the New Orleans area. So I had to fucking drive fucking three hours anyway. That's what I'm saying. So you might as well just fucking, you know, do it independently. Just ride down there. Pay the paper for the gas. I get fucking almost 60 miles to gallon, maybe 55, 60 miles to a gallon on the, on the XB9. But I could take the 12, too. Get Mileage is about the same. Might be even better because I can lower that RPM on the 1203 and just cruise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as long movie, as you're yeah. careful, it's like, yeah. you know, you just go down there. You should probably go down there and see him at some point because yeah. it's been. Well, last time you went to see him was when he had the heart bypass. Yeah. And when was that? Two years ago? Three years ago? More. Yeah, about three years. I think it was three years He's ago. He's lasted longer than I thought he was going to last, actually. I didn't think he was really going to make it through that whole fucking bypass thing. I mean, from he I didn't, died a couple times. They brought that's his what ass I mean. Back. It's like I didn't go, but like the way you described it, because you were out there for what two they weeks? Fucking shocked him back alive when he was already cut open. I was surprised too. I think that yeah. was three years ago. Yeah, pretty sure that was three years ago. Uh, he let's... complained the whole time. <laughs> Why am I here? <laughs> He, he sounds like Sonny, you're, said, you're gonna get exactly like that when you yeah. get old, Tom. Well, you're already kind of like yeah. that, all crotchety. You're he told his friend. His friend like Sonny that. was there, and Sonny, go to go out to my truck, get my gun. We're getting out of here. <laughs> and he meant it. He was, he's gonna bust his way. Out. Yeah, he he was. And he, his truck wasn't with him. <laughs> so, and, and Sonny knows he's fucking hallucinating. He was having those fucking. He thought he had been abducted by a cult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He really, he knew he was in a hospital, but he didn't believe it. Oh my god. Yeah, he thought he got it. Samantha abducted. said, uh, who are you talking about? Tom's dad. Tom, yeah. 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 Tom Senior. He thought he thought he got abducted by a cult. <laughs> when they put him in a and hospital. They were doing experiments on He had a heart bypass yeah. a couple years, two or three years ago. And yeah. Tom went out to see him. I'd leave and come back in, like this is in a recovery room, and start talking to him and realize and I, and I was slowly realize that he didn't know who I was. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, that's par for the course. Though. Yeah, he didn't know who I was. And I says, you know, I, you know I'm your son, right? Goes, oh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. I do have one yeah. of those. Yeah. Forget where he was. Forget By the I, way, I'm full of turkey necks. Did yeah, I tell yeah. you that? No, yeah. I thought they put him back together with turkey necks. Oh, your poor dad. Mm-hmm. You should probably go visit him, though. Mm-hmm. Like I said, like maybe after yeah. the first of the month, like after payday or whatever. 
That's because his his there. neighbor who takes care of him, Clarice, she's uh, this. She just she's a good looking um, black woman who's his neighbor, who's the wife of a black dude who is he's National Guard sergeant major. And they, they watch out over my dad real well. She checks on him fucking every day and shit fucking, you know. I got him on Facebook. I'm thanking him all the time for them staying on top of him. And uh, she came and visited him in the hospital and then went back. And he remembered that. Well, one of the things that she would give him all the time is fucking turkey necks. Like his dish. It, it, whenever she was making turkey necks, she'd give him some. You know, it was a Mississippi food, you know. Because she, he saw her, he made that turkey neck connection, and he thought that the doctors had reassembled his hearts using turkey neck parts. He goes, I saw them put turkey necks in. I said, no, Dad, no, no. I mean, maybe they did. I saw them. <laughs> He's just fucking gone crazy. He had fucking hospital psychosis and fucking the drugs and shit. Weird. It happens. Yeah. I mean, they're used to it. He had a fucking out-of-body experience. He wasn't in there partially. He was trying to escape. Losing his fucking mind. Yeah. All in a couple days period. Uh, Zach says, Hey, y'all. How's the storm going? We kind of covered that a little bit at the beginning, but it's still a few hours, like, south of us. Um, we're probably going to get the worst that we're going to get maybe, I kind of feel like, early this morning. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like every like it's raining outside a little bit and we still get like we get gusts every now and then, yeah. but we're not getting the worst of it I think until cuz it's supposed to be the eye is supposed to be over Orlando at what? Like tomorrow morning at 8. And we're yeah. about 30 miles north of Orlando. Downtown Orlando. So yeah. we'll see. You know what sucks is my my poor sister. She's coming down to Disney on Saturday. So I'm kind of hoping that everything, because Disney's closed today and tomorrow. Um, but I'm kind of hoping that her vacation isn't ruined, too, because she paid a lot of money for that. But I think Disney will have all their shit together mm. by the time Sunday, because I was supposed to go on Sunday and, like, uh, see her. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Zach says he'd heard of turkey neck soup and never heard of just eating them. Yeah, yeah, just eat them, man. Uh, she slow cooks them, and then they're kind of fried. So it's kind of like eating fried chicken. On the bow, it's like that. But you can get a lots of them for next to nothing in Mississippi, so you can turn forty dollars into enough to feed like fucking ten people. You know, she got a big family, kids and stuff, and she, you know, it's a Mississippi thing. It's food is like a a religion. That's in, why everyone's in the so South. fat. Yeah, <laughs> and they share a lot of food. Happened in my family too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Why aren't you eating? Yeah. Have a third helping. Come yeah. on. And s Are you sick? <laughs> and in the South, it's just called food. In the North, they call it soul food. But black people and white people eat the same food in the South, pretty much. It's just The only difference is family recipes. So it's just, that's what, that's what the traditional foods are, you know. And Clarice is like, Clarice is real cute. She's a good-looking woman. And uh, my dad loves her. You know, he, you know I, I could... And his friends like her, you know. And these are all old guys. And Clarice is like 43, 44 maybe. You know, she's younger than Jenny probably. So he remembers seeing her, you know what I mean? He, he, I guess he thinks about it. He's probably got a crush on her, probably, you know. But she's married, you know. But she feeds him, so he's he loves her, you know. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Clarice. Zach says, it's actually perfect you guys are doing this topic because yeah. I've been watching a ton of videos lately by a guy who's a fine art restorer. Yeah, I'm fascinated by that kind of stuff. This guy, I've been wanting to do a show about this guy forever and it's just kind of like, I was so happy because I, I put him in the Patreon poll like a bunch of times and it never wins. But this time it like won overwhelmingly. I'm like, finally, like I get to do this because I read a book about this dude like a long time ago and he's like fascinating. I don't know why like art forgery is like really fascinating to me, mm -hmm. but I guess that's what it is because I'm kind of into art anyway, but I don't know. I'm just fascinated by art forgers. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, Zach also said, I meant what I said about doing a show on Queen Victoria. That woman was fascinating. Yeah, we probably should. Mm. Ben said, you need to visit your dad more often. Yeah, uh, well. And Zach said, I'd still kill to see Tom's dad on the show or something. I want to hear his voice for real. Shit, man. That's like, pretty much what, that's You don't want to see him. Any, he, he's only <laughs> 130 pounds now. Yeah. He's down to nothing. 
My phone's ringing. Cancer got him. Cancer yeah. and all kinds of other stuff got him, too. That's why and maybe in a yeah. week or two you should probably yeah, get he, out there, I imagine. And they're telling him he needs to go on chemo, and he's like, fuck that shit, just let me die. He's one, he's doing that like that. He's, he's, he's getting pissed off. My grandmother would got Yeah, because like he, he doesn't feel good. Yeah. He says, I can't do nothing anyway. It's time for me to go. It's his choice. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. Like yeah. I said, this is my grandmother. My grandmother did the same thing. Yeah, she kind of went through the surgery yeah. and stuff, and they were like, "Well, we didn't get it all. Like we have to do chemo." And she was like, "Yeah, no." Yeah. He, nope. he, he's he's saying, "Why the hell should I fight and claw for every every minute of life? And all I'm gonna do is sit here and watch television. I can't do nothing. It sucks because I don't feel good. So I don't blame him. I don't either. Says this shit's yeah. over. Yeah." But like I said, probably yeah. after the first of the month, you should probably go see him. Yeah, I'm gonna try to ride up there and see him. You know, I mean, just if money works out, then I'll, it should work out. Yeah, I mean, it shouldn't be that expensive to go out no. there, like depending because you can see you can stay in his house, right? Well, there's some yeah, but there's some stuff I gotta buy. But it would still be cheaper than a plane ticket. Than a plane ticket, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, let's see. Ben says, people like hearing about art forgery because it's essentially a story of experts being made fools of by yeah. often uneducated people. Yeah. Yeah. And um, in, this, in this case, it's the Nazis. The Nazis didn't know what the fuck they were doing either a lot of times. Well, the thing, this is them. like a really interesting story because, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of like really interesting angles to this. And the thing about, um, and I'm sure if, if anyone is Dutch, I'm sure I'm going to like pronounce because this is like the, the guy's Dutch. And he, like, uh, grew up in the Netherlands. So I'm just kind of like, I'm just warning you ahead of time that probably all of the Dutch names I'm going to mispronounce horribly, so I apologize for that. But he wasn't, um, he actually wasn't all that uneducated. He, the thing that I find interesting about art forgery is that it's illegal, like, it's a criminal enterprise, but you can't just be half-assed about it. You got to commit. You got to go all in. This dude spent years and years and years trying to figure out how to like forge these so he could get away with it you know what i mean so it's almost kind of you almost kind of want to let him get away with it because it's like well he put so much work into it you know what i mean yeah but what's interesting about this guy too i mean there's a lot of interesting things about him too was that um one i kind of feel like his forgeries at first were not great but there was kind of like some other factors that made people like be like oh my god it's a real you know but even though they weren't really that fantastic. Um, and then, like, his, the quality of them got shittier and shittier. And, you know, he got away with it for a long time. And he made a fuck ton of money before he got caught. And the way that he got caught was really kind of interesting. So I first heard about this guy when I was a kid. And I had this book called Strange Stories, Amazing Facts, which was one of those big, like, Reader's Digest compilation books. I still have it. And I remember... Uh, the name of the article about this guy was called He Paints for His Life. Mm. Um, and it kind of paints a picture of him because the interesting thing about this guy is that he kind of has a popular there's a popular notion about him. It's like, oh, you know, he fooled the Nazis and everything. And I kind of put that in the like on the thumbnail and everything like that because I kind of feel like that's the popular conception of him. And I don't know. Yes, it's technically true. But I don't think it was almost kind of like incidental that that happened. You know what I mean? Which we'll get into. It's just like a really, really interesting story. Uh, Mr. 88 said quality art forgery is an art in itself, like stealth bank robbery. Yeah, I think that's what it is. I kind of admire like I don't admire that they're breaking the law, but you have to admire like there's much easier ways to break the law if, if that's your inclination. But if you go into, like, these high-end bank robberies or, like, art forgery or something like that, like I said, that takes commitment. You can't just half-assed... You can't just half ass art forgery. You have to know what you're doing. Um, because you will get caught immediately if you don't. Yeah. You'll get caught immediately. This dude, like you I said, this dude spent years and years and years perfecting the yeah. shit. You can't... Uh... You can't half ass making counterfeit bills either. Exa well, yeah, they exactly. Had guys exactly. Cut whole plates and they'd fucking exactly. make a damn counterfeit. So I admire that. Yeah. I admire like the the technique and the art that goes into it. Um, and it's just kind of a shame that they were obviously like really talented, but used it for nefarious purpose. But I don't know. Like art forgery, I kind of feel. I don't want to say it's a victimless crime because it's not. But. 
art forgery is almost kind of like stuff you can kind of like be okay with it it's like no one's necessarily gonna get murdered over the shit or anything like that so i don't know it's so, just i don't feel too bad about it's it just an, it's just like a con game yeah that's what i mean and I, don't, I don't think anybody should get conned that's not cool but i don't know i, I can't get too mad at it yeah you know what i mean like it's just on the spectrum of crime it's one that makes yeah. me the least mad yeah. That one and kind of like, like I said, bank robberies, you know, as long as you don't hurt anybody or threaten anybody or anything like that. But one of the, another thing that I wanted to do a show about that I kept putting in the uh, Patreon poll but hasn't won yet is the Antwerp uh, Diamond Heist because that was another thing that had, was a, like a whole team and they took like two or three years and they had a mole on the inside and it was just kind of like, I mean, the shit, the lengths that they went to, I was almost kind of like, man, just let them have it. Yeah. If they're gonna do all that, holy shit! <clears throat> now, I don't, now I don't really know how Jenny's gonna structure this show. I haven't seen the seen her notes, but this is most a lot of this is gonna have to do with the guy who's basically scamming dudes out of third right. Well, he scammed one dude out of third right. Okay. He scammed other dudes. So it's not we'll all of them. No, all right. no, no. Because there was a bunch of art theft that went on with the third right too. And uh, if we're not gonna take it from that angle, then I don't know exactly what I'm gonna. Maybe I shouldn't even talk about it. Um, well, it's relevant. I mean, the thing about it, it is kind of relevant. We'll get into that in a little bit. The thing about, thing about the dude, the the, uh, the dudes in the Third Reich, especially the, the 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 upper command. They were basically coming out of a damn kind of like a revolution slash civil war. They were working class and middle class dudes that really didn't come from money. And then all of a sudden they make it they make it big. They're now in charge of Germany. And they they're trying to pick up upper class and upper crust tastes, but they don't fucking have they don't really have the background for it. So it was kind of easy to fool them with with fakes. And it was easy to fool them with you could con them into buying shit. It was funny like oh, okay, there's a lot of witnesses that would say that not only Mustache Man, but a lot of the other high fucking level fucking Nazis would do shit like hire contractors to renovate fucking these castles, and the fucking decor was horrendous. All right, and it was just it was not the kind of decor that an upper class German would put in there. It was the kind of decor that would go that a working class German would put in there, trying to emulate upper class taste. Yeah. but you could see that it wasn't. That they weren't really, you know, that they didn't really have good taste in things, even though they wanted people to respect them, you know. So, because a lot of them had that, not all of them, but most of them had a background like that, they were ripe for buying shit like fake art mm -hmm. and fucking fake knockoff fucking decor and fucking well because they shit. were it, they were almost like yeah. really graspingly desperate to be seen as someone as that was like upper class uh, that yeah. somebody that had like really good taste taste and shit but that's not how they really were but yeah but it, that's kind of a hard thing to fake mm -hmm. really and people who yeah. are actually upper class or who are from old money or like have actual yeah, they good do it taste, effortlessly it's, it's just not their yeah because they grew up in yeah. that cult whole milieu and they yeah. don't like need to yeah. put it on for anybody yeah it's not a put on it's just how they are right these those guys had to put it on because. Look, man, Mustache Man was homeless, slept underneath the bridge. He was a corporal in World War One. He was a, you know, I'm not saying he was a total nobody. It's just that he didn't have money. He didn't come from money. His dad was fucking working class, maybe lower middle class. He was a, fi a fucking official. I think he worked at some licensing office or post office. I don't remember exactly what it was, but Alois was his name. And then a lot of the other guys were really wasn't much to him, you know. Goring was uh, he was probably one of the higher class ones. He was an officer in World War One and a damn World War One fighter ace. I mean, and they kind of recruited him just to give them some mojo, you know, to make them seem more official. But he was also kind of you know morphine addict, and um, he had a lot of stolen art. Would dress well, up it in was a damn actually, toga. It was actually Goring that uh, got fucked over. Is he the one? Family. Okay, yeah, he would fucking dress up in a toga and fucking have all this fucking art around him and he 
you know, LARPed as a damn Roman fucking emperor when people people weren't around, you know. But okay, it was Goring that was buying it. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. But Goring really, his he was middle class, middle class, maybe uh, maybe upper middle class. So that's funny that he was the one that fell for it. <laughs> but he also had a lot of real art too. Uh, stolen. Well, yeah. Stolen. Yeah. We'll get into that later. Yeah. But. Uh, Hugo said, remember that guy that made the coffin of James, brother of Jesus? He replicated 2,000-year-old uh, uh, patinas, and people believed him. He almost got away with it. I remember hearing yeah. about that. They made a documentary about that shit, like, if it was real. It wasn't real, but yeah. So, like I said, I do kind of admire... Like I said, I don't really admire people that con other people out of money. But the thing about art forgery is that usually the people that they're conning have a shit ton of money, so I can't feel too bad about it. And like I said, you kind of have to admire the art that they put into it. Cause like I said, yeah. you can't just like slap some shit on a fucking canvas and be like, hey, look, it's a what? It's a Rembrandt. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, no one's gonna fall for that. I, I saw one program though that talked about the art forgery angle. And sometimes they said that the dude buying the art forgery didn't care if it was forged or not. It just had to be a good enough forgery to fool his friends. That that was what. Yeah, which yeah, and that's another thing. Himself. And he's to, just like, well, it's worth it to me to drop however many million yeah, dollars. And my friends will. It's think like, that's yeah, real. it could be a fake, but it doesn't. Yeah, matter. I don't care. Right? It yeah. Doesn't matter. So a lot of there was a lot of that in the art forgery stuff too. Yeah. They're like, well, that'll fool my friends, even if it's a forgery. I don't give a shit. Yeah, as long as they kind of are As long impressed. as they believe it. Right. Ben says the customers are usually dishonest in some way, too. They mm -hmm. generally believe they're buying stolen art, at the least. Yeah, yeah, yeah So yeah. there's that, too. Yeah. So, like I said, it's not, you know, it's still a crime, but it's kind of one that I don't really feel too bad about. But, like I said, Han Van Meegeren, I've always, like, and I'm, like I said, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, but he's always kind of been a fascinating figure to me. He's not... I kind of feel like, uh, like I said, the popular kind of portrayal of him is kind of like, oh, he's the hero that, like, pulled the wool over the eyes of the Nazis. That's not exactly right. Um, things are always kind of, like, a lot more complicated than that. Uh, but we'll get into that in a little bit. But he's still, like, a fascinating <coughs> dude anyway. So are we ready to get into this? Go ahead and do it. Yeah, Ben said famous religious fraud. I've actually been wanting to do a show. I should probably write this down. I thought I had it in my list, but maybe I don't. I've actually been wanting to do a show about, like, fake religious relics. Because there's a lot of that. Because so, there's a whole, that's a whole other market. Like, I read a, a whole bunch of books about that, and it's, like, really, really interesting. Let me go ahead and re give you another drink here. Okay. Because I always, like, I don't know. I'm always, like, really interested. I don't know why I'm so fascinated by, like, art forgery and architectural or, uh, not architectural. What am I talking about? Um, what's the word? Oh, my God. It just went right in my head. It also starts with an A. Archaeological. Jesus Christ. What the fuck is the matter with me? I'm, like, not even drunk. <laughs> this guy looks like a fake-ass Ian McKellen. He does a little bit. The only Dutch name he didn't know is Edward Van Halen. <laughs> I was watching another video about this guy earlier, and uh, the guy that's on there, he's a really cool, like, he has, like, a million channels. Um, what's his name? Simon Whistler. Like, he's a British guy. And he does, like, he's one called Biographics and uh, Today I Learned and stuff like that. So he did a show about this guy, and he was trying to, like, pronounce the stuff right, but he was just kind of, at the end, he was just like, fuck it, I'm not Dutch, sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to pronounce it the way it looks. So I'm like, yeah, that's probably what I'm going to do, too, because I'm just, like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it. And plus, I feel like really pretentious when I try to pronounce things the way that they're. Vodka is awesome. It is very good. No, you haven't had it yet. Oh, I haven't. That was regular vodka. Oh, that was the end of the Bacardi. That's oh, okay. pineapple now. Try it. Ooh, pineapple it good. On. Yeah, it's really good. Ooh, that's that new brand that we bought. Yeah. Samantha said that's age. Yeah, because I said architectural when I was trying to think of archaeological. Yeah. Well, because, well, in my defense, the word architecture is right there, yeah, like, in front of my face, like, on my notes, so. Yeah, the way this is going, the, the, the hurricane will arrive. It will arrive on, sta on stage partway. I mean, it'll be blowing Maybe. out there in, in about an hour or two. Maybe. We'll see. Yeah. I'm kind of hoping it's kind of quiet out there now, but we'll see how I looked out that back window. I could see it. Uh-oh. Can you, can you see, like, the, the bands? No, I can see the wind blowing. Oh. 
Uh, Mr. 88 said, if you're going to do a show on fake religious documents, you should focus on the Mormons. I've oh, actually, yeah, yeah. I want to do a whole why, show. Why salamander letters and all that. Uh, yeah, I want to do a whole show on the Mormons, yeah. actually. That's right. They have an entire organization that buys and or fake documents that uh, contradict their gospel. Yep, that's right. They do. I saw a documentary about that not too long ago. Yep. So, yeah, the Mormons would need their whole own show. And I think I think that's on my list, but I'm going to write it down again just in case because the Mormons I'm, will buy a fake even though they even if they know it's a fake. Yeah. Just they just don't want it around. Well, that's what he's saying. Yeah. That it's like they're trying to like take stuff out of circulation. Yeah. All right, so uh, so let's get into this before, like I said, I don't want like the hurricane to hit and like fucking knock the power out or nothing like that. Um, Oscar says, watch Barbarian while it's still in theaters. Honestly, every single person except one person has told me that Barbarian is awesome and that we should go see it. I did, I did get one message from somebody that said it was terrible, but and don't bother with it. But everybody else that I've seen has said it was like really, really good. So I'll pro I probably won't see it. Like I said, I've seen like a lot of buzz about it. But yeah, we'll we'll see that. All right. So we're talking today about Han Van Meegeren. Like I said, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. I'm not Dutch. My stupid phone is fucking just yeah. What is ringing. up with that? It's just uh, um, warnings from the storm. No, it's um, it's telemarketers. Oh. I get fucking zillions of fucking telemarketer shows like uh, calls all the time, every day. And I thought I turned the the thing off, but it's just like making a irritating noise. So, yeah. So, like I said, known as a painter and portraitist, one of the in most ingenious art forgers of the 20th century. Now, as I said, he's kind of like perceived as a, or became perceived as a national hero after World War II because of the whole story about how he, uh, he didn't necessarily sell it to the Nazis, he traded it. But we'll get into that in a little bit, too, uh, to uh, Goring. And so after that, it was like, hey, yeah, he fucked over the Nazis and stuff like that. But like I said, it's not exactly how it happened. And like, there's a lot more complication to it than that. But we'll get into that. Okay, so he was born in 1889. Um, now, his family was middle class, very Catholic. Like his dad was a uh, schoolmaster. And uh, <laughs> apparently his dad was not real down with his whole, like his son's artistic temperament, I guess. Because Han liked to, his name's uh, Henricus, actually, but Han was like a nickname. He was more into like painting and drawing and shit like that. Uh, and of course, his dad thought that was useless. <clears throat> so his dad was kind of always shitting on him all the time. One of the stories they tell about him as a kid was that his dad would always kind of like make him write a hundred, like, like in school. You know how they make you write like a hundred times on a piece of paper or some shit? They made him write... Um, I know nothing, I am nothing, I am capable of nothing. That's nice, like, that your dad does that to you. I'm mm. sure that doesn't have an effect on your life at all. But, yeah, so his dad really sounds like a douche. So, anyway, uh, so, yeah, so his dad thought, like, you know, art, painting, drawing, stuff like that was a useless profession. Little did he know. So he's like, well, you can study architecture. That's at least something useful. So he sent him to Delft. Now, Delft was the town uh, that Jan Vermeer was from, which, you know, will, that, that'll be significant later on. So he sent him there to study architecture. Now, um, pretty much, like, Han was just kind of like, he was really good at the whole architecture thing. Like, he passed all the tests and everything, but he just never took the finals. He was like, look, I don't really give a shit about architecture. I don't want to be an architect. I want to be a painter. Um, but he, it wasn't because he was like bad at it. He was like actually really good at it and like won some awards and shit. And he actually did, um, he designed the clubhouse for his rowing club, like in Delft and it's still there like to this day. So there's that. Now, while he was at school, he actually met this, one of his teachers who was a painter and that this guy's name was Bartus Cortelling. Now he kind of like took Han under his wing. Now, Cortelling was a big fan of Jan Vermeer, Johannes Vermeer, and he basically showed uh, Han van Meegeren how Vermeer had made his colors. Because like I said, back in the old days when Jan Vermeer was painting, uh, you couldn't just go to Michael's and buy oil paint. You had to grind your own pigments and mix them with, you know, you mix them with oil, you mix them with whatever. Egg whites. Oh, well, no, that's tempera, that's tempera mostly. Right, yeah. Like, yeah, this yeah. would be like oil paint. 
So, but yeah, you usually had to like grind your own stuff. So he actually showed him how Vermeer had done it. So like I said, this is kind of like pretty early on in his career. Now, the thing about it too, is that um, Bardis Cortelling and as well as uh, Han Van Meegeren, they were really not about this because you have to think this is late 19th century, early 20th century. All the rage, modern art, impressionism, surrealism, all that kind of stuff. Um, and Cortelling and Van Meegeren were not having it. They just wanted to go back to the classics, the old masters. They thought all of this new shit, like impressionism and surrealism and cubism and all that kind of stuff was degenerate. It was that kind of stuff. So, you know, um, and that uh, I kind of feel like Cortelling's uh, feelings in that regard that he just thought all of the modern art was just like shit and was like it signaled like the end of c seen, civilization or whatever. I've seen the defense of what they're talking about. There's something to be said from from what they're saying. But they're 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 overreacting to it. They're too art centric. It doesn't matter what some dude paints. They were just saying, "Man, you're not supposed to do that to the human form. It fucks up the mind when you look at stuff like that. The humans don't look that way. That's a distortion of humans." You're doing psychological damage to people when you fucking fuck up their appreciation for beauty and stop warping people's idea of what beauty is. So I kind of understand what they're talking about from That's a dumb, though. From, well, from a philosophical standpoint, I understand what they're talking about. It's just that it doesn't matter. It sounds the art world doesn't matter. Everything like that sounds like old man yelling at Cloud, pretty much. Every, every time well, somebody says some shit like that. You say what you want, and they say what they want. That's I'm just, just saying, that's what it sounds like. I every time I hear that, I'm like, all right, Grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't think they were old, though. Those, most no, but I'm just... You when know. I say Grandpa, that yeah. I don't necessarily mean you're old in age. I mean that you're old in attitude. That's they what were just I mean. saying it was disrespectful. When I call you Grandpa. And that you shouldn't be messing with people. Well, there are some, there are some shit I agree with them along that point. Like, I've seen them build buildings that are just fucking atrocious. Like... You got to be a fucking asshole to make a building look like that. I mean, that motherfucker's ugly, you know. Looks like a damn prison block, you know what I mean? And then, and then later on, you find out that yeah, there was kind of a damn psychological motive behind doing that. And uh, like one of the things that I'm thinking about is like some of the Soviet, some of the Soviet buildings that they built were designed to uh, uh, to uh, intimidate people. With like bleakness and uh, uh, you know what I mean, like the secret police building would just look like as bleak as fuck. So there, the people, the people that make that shit sometimes do have a psychological motive behind it. Oh yeah, I'm not saying that, yeah. and I'm not saying that there's not some art and some architecture that I personally think is ugly. Yeah. Um, a lot of stuff that I think is ugly, I usually find it ugly if it's just like functional. I mean, yeah. I kind of like buildings that they kind of like pimped out some, like right. make it look cool, like yeah. make it look beautiful. No, like it doesn't matter if there's a bunch of stuff on there that's not functional, yeah. you know, but I think that there's a lot to be said for like, you know, making things look beautiful just for the sake of them being yeah, beautiful. Yeah, but that's not the Soviet building I was talking about. The one that one that they actually pointed out was totally functional, but it was it was designed to be bleak and hopeless looking. So when you saw it, it was like an immovable object that dominated you. And if you went in there, you'd never come out. That was, And that was literally what it was they were trying to make you feel when you saw it. It was some kind of KGB building that they built. It was something you were supposed to see it and have dread for it. And, you know, and evidently it achieved its purpose. Yeah. Well, like I said, anything that looks like that, I just think is ugly. It doesn't, like, intimidate me or anything it was like ugly. that. I'm just like, wow, it's just ugly. It was real ugly. Because it doesn't, you know, like I said, it doesn't have any, it doesn't look like it has any beauty to it or remember, any art to it or anything. If I remember correctly, anything. you know, I hadn't seen it in a long time. It was just square and squat, had pipes on the outside of it. Looked yeah, that's like what I'm saying. Like a goddamn machine. And you were supposed to see that thing and go, I don't want to go in there. But they would make you go in there. It was where they were going to, it was where they were going to fucking torture you, basically. Wasn't that, isn't there like an art? I can't remember. It's been a long time since I took art appreciation. It's probably been like 20 years, but. They're, like, what is brutalist architecture is usually just, like, functional square, right? Without any yeah. kind of, like, yeah. I think that's what they call it. Yeah. Well, that's how they had that thing hooked up. It was some kind of secret police station. 
Mr. 88 said, I find Victorian era interior design atrocious. It makes one's eye twitch. I love minimalism. Others feel the exact opposite. Honestly, um, I like both things depending on how they're done. Um, minimalism, I think, looks really good in certain applications. Like if something's just like really, you know, like lots of open space and stuff. Like it, I don't know, it depends on the space. It depends on like how it's utilized. Like sometimes I really like that too. Um, but I'm usually more a fan of kind of like more Victorian or Baroque or things like that. Thing. No, leave it, leave it. I'm just gonna put it in the other room. Leave it, it's fine. It's driving me crazy. Um, but you know, I tend to like, uh, Zach said I'm still obsessed with 1920s art lately. Yeah, it's like mine too. Like I really like Art Deco, Art Nouveau. I like stuff like that, which some people think might be too much, which like I said, that's fine. I like minimalism in some applications too. Like I said, like some Victorian stuff I've seen. Yeah, it's like there's too much crap. It's too crowded and stuff like that. I get it, but modern interpret it depends how it looks though. A lot of the modern interpretation of Victorian stuff looks a lot better than the way it really did. If you look at some of the some of the early crime scene photography and shit that was around during the Victorian early photography where they were taking pictures of stuff, you see the interiors, the way they really looked back in those days, it looked like a damn funeral home. You know, and it was kind of dark in there and they had weird shit up around the corners and stuff and weird cabinets and it just... Some of that Victorian stuff that the average person lived in. Not rich people, but what average people lived in was fucking spooky looking, man. I mean, say, didn't if make you want to know, like, what I would actually like if I had money and could, like, design a house the way I wanted, um, it would either look like that shit from Suspiria, like the original Suspiria, not the remake, um, or the, like, the really, really, like, Art Nouveau looking building in um, that Giallo movie that I just talked about the other day that I can't remember. But, yeah, that one. Um, although that was kind of like a ruin, but... You know what I mean? If it was like nice, like those windows and stuff, I just like really wanted those. But you know what I mean? It's just, but I like minimalism too in certain applications. So I don't know. I, I have styles that I like, but I'm always open to new things. You know what I mean? Like I'm usually more into, like as far as art is concerned, I'm usually more into kind of more classical kind of stuff or like, you know, kind of more old masters type stuff. But when I went to, when I go to modern art museums, like when I went to MoMA and New York and stuff like that, like I saw some shit in there that I thought was like pretty awesome. Like, for example, I had seen pictures of like, for like Jackson Pollock in books and things like that. Cause like I said, I took lots of art appreciation, like in college and stuff like that. And I was always just kind of like, yeah, I can see why people would like that, but I'm not really into it. But when I saw a Jackson Pollock in person, um, I was like, oh, like, I get it now. You know what I mean? It's a lot different seeing one in person than seeing a picture of one. You know what I mean? So there's that too. But generally I tend to kind of prefer, but I do like a lot of, like, I know there was like a few years ago, there was kind of like a big surge in kind of lowbrow art, I guess is what they called it where it was kind of people that were into like old comic books and all that kind of stuff that were coming up with all this kind of shit. And, you know, there are artists like Travis Louie, who I actually met in uh, New York, where he would do like these really weird portraits that were kind of like old Victorian portraits, but they were like animal heads or like people that had like weird deformities or were like monsters and stuff. And they were fucking super cool. So I really liked that kind of, oh, and that guy, Who's that guy? God damn it, I can't remember his name. But he did these sculptures that were like, that would come out from the wall and they were like, like kind of monster heads, like werewolves and stuff, but they looked like they were made of like cake frosting. And they were like really, really cool. I was like super into those. They were really, really cool looking. So I like a, kind of that kind of stuff, but you never, I don't know. You never know what I'm gonna like until I look at it. Cause I'm kind I have like a very broad uh, thing. I have things that I like, but you never know. You never know. So, uh, so yeah. So basically, so these two uh, crotchety old farts, <laughs> these, these crotchety young farts, um, were just like, oh, this new art today. These these kids today with their Van Goghs and their this and their that. It was that kind of thing. That's what I'm imagining. But they didn't. They didn't like it. They said it was degenerate. I'm gonna fucking. I'm gonna still defend some of what some of the shit that they said. 
I actually saw posters, okay, of, of the fucking prop, the, 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 the Nazi propaganda posters against the degenerate arts. You can find them on YouTube. What they're showing is degenerate art does suck. All right. It's just shitty drawings. But what's funny is the reaction to it. They're overreacting to it. Yeah, it's no as, doubt. It's as if art is important. I never really thought art was that important. But basically all they're saying, is these are memes. It's, it's from another era. They didn't have internet back then, but it was the equivalent of fucking somebody just posting, this sucks. They the had to get outraged about something. Well, there was a bunch of stuff. It was cultural. It was a cultural revolution. and they Some were people just, aren't happy unless they were they're just, getting outraged they're about something that doesn't mean anything. It's the, same, it's, it's the same thing that happens online. It was the equivalent That's of, what I'm saying. It's, it's the equivalent of making something, in, of saying in the comment section, this sucks. And well, that's it's just like people really, see people crying nowadays. Yeah, about, oh my sucks. god, this this movie like raped my childhood. Yeah, it's yeah, like that. Like, yeah. I'm just like shut yeah. up. Like not, god. But damn. I think everybody kind of. I think Fucking everybody kind of makes makes a big deal out of it. Not only were the was Mustache Man and his and his party making a big deal over shitty art. People come in and make a big deal over them saying that the art was shitty too. You know what I mean? When really saying that the art was shitty wasn't important to begin with because the art wasn't important. It was equivalent to somebody saying something on a damn YouTube channel, on a YouTube video. It's really, back in those days, there was no medium other than print. So if you print something or make a poster, fucking, it, for some reason in the human mind, it becomes more important. Whoa, they printed that? Wow, look at that picture. Oh, they said that in print? Whoa, it's on the news? It's all equal. It's all shit. It just happened to be part of the conversation at the time. And it got frozen in history as, well, they didn't like the bad art, or they didn't like, or they liked the good art, or, wow. But that's just part of the nature of the show. I guess that's nature of human beings, you know what I mean? They make comments. Uh, yeah, the art sucked. I saw, I saw what they were talking about. But Van Gogh and the other ones? They didn't make any comments about that. They probably would have been forced to say it sucked under fucking social pressure, but it's obvious that Van Gogh doesn't suck. That's pretty good. Hein van Meegeren hated Van Gogh. Yeah, but it's, it's obvious that Van Gogh's pretty good. Van Gogh is a genius. Yeah, I I mean, yeah it's pretty I'm good. not a huge fan of Impressionism, but I really yeah. do like Van Gogh's right. stuff. Right. And I and I concede that that's just a personal taste yeah. thing. I know a lot of people really like impressionism. It's not my <laughs> thing, but I on on the other hand, I have seen some impressionist paintings that I yeah. actually really really liked that I would hang on my wall. Yeah. So there's that too. The Nazis probably would have burned Van Gogh, <laughs> but they probably would have burned burned Van Gogh, thinking that's pretty good. But we gotta burn it. We gotta burn it because that's, uh, we we have to stay on because brand. we gotta stay on brand. Right? That's exactly what they would have done. Yeah. That's how Mustache Man and those guys were. It was all about principle and the narrative. They had to stay inside their narrative. They had to go, shit, I gotta burn it. Okay. Uh, Mr. 88 said Nazis hated art because they couldn't understand it. Yeah, probably to a degree. Uh, creativity breeds critical thinking and they could not have that. Yeah, that was probably uh, no, something no, to do no, with no, it too. No, yeah, no. yeah, it probably I, was. I say no. It no, probably they, was. They understood art. They wanted to control it. That's, that's what they wanted. They saw art as propaganda. But it wasn't just them. The Soviets were the same way. The only art that existed in Soviet Russia was propaganda art. That's what it was. They knew what, they knew quality when they saw it. It's just that they wouldn't allow it. That's what it was. They, they, they did not... It was a medium that both of those parties wanted to control. And if it didn't have... If it wasn't making a political statement that supported their narrative, they didn't allow it. That's what it was. Mr. 88 is talking about uh, English medieval art. Actually, I really, really like a lot of medieval art. I love stained glass. I love all of that uh, kind of old religious art, like from the 14th century. Um, I've That's one of my actually favorite uh, sections of the Met in New York is all of the, the big medieval section with all the stained glass windows and stuff. It's, it's <coughs> beautiful. Beautiful. But I'm just, I'm kind of like, man, if people want to make art, make art. I don't care what it looks like. Like I said, you're trying to like, you try to control narratives like that. Yeah. Um, you're going to have a bad time. And the Russians were all about controlling the political narrative and it all had to be about Marxism, socialism, communism, and class struggle. That was the narrative. 
with the Germans, it was also that, but it had a racial element to it. They didn't want anybody outside ger the Germanic sphere saying anything in art. So if it wasn't really a Germanic artist, it was going to either be destroyed or be at the bottom. Because they wanted to control narrative. Yeah, that's what Marx said. It didn't Hans have anything to do with were the... totalitarian. Yeah, so if it, it wasn't ha... from them, it had to be. Exactly. Destroyed. It didn't have anything to do with the quality of it. It had to do with who was saying it. They were just trying to ban people out of the space. It was like banning somebody off Twitter. It was like that. It just, uh, in those days, the medium was, one of the mediums was art. Art and print, and you know. They are just trying to dominate. They're basically dominating their version of the internet. So. Okay, so let's get back to this. So, yeah, so Van Meegeren, uh, him and his buddy are, like, uh, whining about degenerate art, as I imagine they would. In 1911, uh, he knocked up his girlfriend named Anna de Voot. Uh, she was a Protestant. He was a Catholic. Apparently, that wasn't a thing. So they got married and uh, had a couple kids. Now, he started working as an assistant drawing instructor, which I think was the only, like real job he ever had like he got rich later on but yeah this was the only real job he ever had now 1917 he moved to the hague and there he started working as an artist now the thing about again i kind of feel like the popular narrative about han van meegeren is that he wasn't successful as a real artist like with his own stuff so he said fuck it i'm gonna start faking things and show you motherfuckers that's not exactly the case because he was actually kind of successful with his own artwork. It's just that um, he wasn't really like all that original. Um, he was mostly like kind of hearkening back to old styles, kind of copying old styles. And some critics like called him out for that and he got his feelings hurt over it. And maybe that was kind of like what inspired him to, but honestly, I kind of feel like he started with the forgery thing earlier than that, just like to make more money because he did make some money with his, um, matter of fact, his most famous work of art, which was kind of like this little painting, uh, drawing kind of thing of like a little, like a deer, like a doe or whatever. Um, it w actually got quite famous and like they sold prints of it, like all over the Netherlands and stuff like that. So he wasn't, it wasn't like he was a starving artist, you know what I mean? It was like, oh, nobody understands me, or nobody's like, like, he was like a fairly successful commercial artist, I guess. Like, you know, he had some paintings that, you know, were kind of popular and like sold prints and things like that. And he was making a living at it. Like he was making a living teaching and stuff like that. But like I said, some of the critics didn't like his shit because they were all into modern art and he was doing like some old shit and he wasn't really that original. And so they kind of like picked on him about it and he didn't like it. So, you know, there was that whole thing. Um, so, uh, so that's the thing. Now his first, he even had an art show like in the Hague in 1917 and he had like a whole bunch of different, that was another thing too, is that as an artist, he didn't seem to have much, uh, focus. I kind of feel like his portraits were his best work, but he did landscapes. He did like a bunch of other shit too. Um, his first show that he had actually got really positive reviews. Like nobody should know about that. Um, but then he started going more into like kind of throwbacks type of stuff, like old, like religious paintings, like old masters type of stuff. And like I said, this is early 20th century. You know, the trend was more toward modern art. So if you were going to do something that was just hearkening back to classicism or stuff that had already been done then yeah the critics were going to be like yeah well we've seen this done better you know 400 years ago so yeah. like why aren't you like bringing something new to the table and it's they were just kind of picking on him for not being creative like pretty much so i think he kind of got upset with that and i think they thought that a lot of his religious paintings that he did a little, little bit later were a little bit saccharine you know what I mean? Like, we're just a little bit too... Like I said, it was kind of like the pure flicks of paintings. Like, yeah. I kind of feel like it was that kind of shit. And that's what they were negatively responding to, maybe. I mean, yeah. So, like, his original arts, I know that he's known nowadays mostly for his forgeries. But he did thousands and thousands of his own original paintings as well. Like, and drawings. Um, he kind of did, like, he did a lot of still lifes. He did a lot of, but like I said, a lot of his stuff was kind of like a throwback to 17th century, that kind of stuff. Um, he even did, like, some weird, like, surrealistic kind of paintings, which you'd think that he wouldn't do because that wasn't his thing. But 
yeah, so he did a lot of his own work as well. So basically, as time went on, even though when he first came out, like everybody said, he was very promising and stuff like that. But as time went on and it seemed that he was, like I said, not really focusing on a style, but just kind of going back and doing, it seemed like he wasn't copying other like artist stuff, but he was just kind of like not coming up with anything different, I guess. So I kind of feel like the critics started to maybe, maybe not turn against him, but they were just kind of like, oh, it's a shame he was like started out with so much talent, but now he's just kind of like retreading like the same ground. I kind of feel like they were talking about that kind of stuff. See, that's the thing. And he kind of spun the narrative later on. Cause like I said, no, we're still talking about like 1917, but later on, like in the 1940s, like after the trial, which, you know, like is, that's coming up. He basically said, um, you know, that he was, he tried to make himself like sound like a victim. He was like uh, driven into a state of anxiety and depression uh, due to the all too meager appreciation of my work. Like nobody loves me. So I was forced into doing this. I kind of feel like he was like playing the victim card a little bit. Um, he says, this is what he said. I decided one fateful day to revenge myself on the art critics and experts by doing something the likes of which the world had never seen before. So a little bit self aggrandizing, a little bit ahistorical because I kind of feel like he was saying this at a time I feel like, I don't know, I know the popular narrative, like I said, is that he's like, oh God, no one appreciates me, so I'm just gonna like, I'm gonna fuck all you guys over by like painting a bunch of fakes and making you fall for it. Um, I kind of feel like he was doing fakes and copies and stuff like that before all of this shit, you know what I mean? I kind of feel like he was just kind of like, oh, well, maybe I can make money doing that because he already knew a lot of stuff about the old Dutch masters and about like their techniques and stuff. So I kind of feel, and he was already painting copies, which a lot of painters do. It's not, somebody pointed out in the comments, it's like, it's not illegal to copy paintings. It's like my ex-husband was an oil painter and he used to copy paintings all the time, but for practice, like he didn't sell them like and say, Hey, it's a Rembrandt or anything like that. Even though he painted in that style, like he painted like things that looked like Rembrandt or he copied like some Rembrandt paintings, but he was just like practicing. You know what I mean? Like he didn't sell them or pretend that they were actually Rembrandt. So a lot of artists do that, but when you try to sell it and pass it off as something, yeah, then that's fraud. But he was doing that kind of stuff. Like, he was copying a lot of old Dutch masters. So, that's the thing. It's, uh, I don't know. I just kind of feel like this whole narrative that he was trying to sell that, oh, nobody loved me and nobody understood me, so I felt the need to fuck everyone over and you guys forced me into it. I kind of feel like that was a narrative that he was later on trying to sell, like, when his ass was on the line. You know See what the I mean? genius of that shit? See it's here? already in a jar. It's already in a jar. <laughs> so you don't even you have to drink get a moonshine. It's already just put the ice in the fucking. This is what it came. It's already in the jar. That's oh, good. Try it. Is this the apple pie one? It's the apple pie. Do we have any butter pecan left? Yeah. Mm. If you want, I can just put the uh, put put ice in the butter pecan. But that's it's a lot of calories in that. Well, that's pecan. not. I mean, the butter pecan thing is you really gotta Boy, like. That's like that a dessert. Of, that's so like yeah. drinking melted ice cream. It's, it's it, delicious, but you gotta yeah. It, it's on it's online with fucking like uh, what do you call it? Bailey's it's like Irish Bailey's. Cream. It's yeah. like Bailey's. It tastes very much like Bailey's, mm. except with a little bit. It's a little bit nutty. The butter pecan. Flavor. Yeah. So yeah. So the thing about it too is that I kind of feel like as Van Meegeren got more into painting copies and fakes and things like that, he made a lot more money, but. I wonder sometimes how much more, like if he had actually tried to develop his own artistic style, because he seemed very talented. Uh, I will say that a lot of his fakes aren't that great, <laughs> but um, you know, he seemed very talented otherwise. And it's like, if he had maybe applied himself to developing his own style, then maybe he might have been successful that way instead of being success, more successful as a forger. I don't know. The thing about it is that he was so successful as a forger. I mean, he was a millionaire many times over. So he didn't live very long, though. I mean, he died pretty young. So there was that. It's just kind of like, I don't, I don't know how it would have worked out. So basically, even though he kind of said that, oh, it's, you know, after critics started like shitting on me, then I decided I was going to like start forging shit just to like fuck them over. But um, 
uh, a recent book about the case. Well, it's not that recent. I think it came out in 2008. Um, was like, the, he's pretty sure that Van Meegeren started fucking around with uh, forgeries and art swindlers and stuff like that in like 1920. And that's at the very latest. So it's a lot earlier than most people like posit that he first started fucking around with art forgery. Yeah. 1920. I like what Mark in the comment section says. He says, in the end, the commies and the Nazis were all hypocrites because they stashed all the good art for themselves. Absolutely true. Banning art and burning art and shit, that was just to keep it out of the hands of the plebes. All the good shit they kept and put that shit in their homes. Exactly. Yeah. Daniel just because you just because you tell the plebes something to believe in doesn't mean you believe in it. It's just a system you give to them. That's a way totalitarianism is always like that. Mr. 88 said commercial artist, so he cast the mold for Thomas Kincaid and his ilk. Yeah. Bastard. Yeah. Poor Thomas Kincaid. We should do a show about that guy. Yeah. <laughs> we did a show about Bob Ross. I don't know, like, uh, Thomas Kincaid. Um, I don't really know much about Thomas Kincaid as a person, but I have seen, like, uh, his stores and malls where they sell. It's like, they're and they're not terrible. It's just kind of like shit that would hang in a hotel room or an Airbnb or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Not offensive, but nothing that you would look twice at. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Which... You know, people, I guess people like that. I don't know. Evidently enough people like it that he has like stores and malls all over the country. So there's that. And even some of them light up, I think. Like they have little lights in them. So I don't know. Uh, but yeah. So uh, according to this other book that was written about him, they said that Han Van Meegeren uh, actually had another mentor who was uh, a painter and also like an art dealer. This guy named Theo Van Win Wingarten? Wingarten. And he basically, him and like this other guy named Leonardis, they would, they would kind of like work together. It's like one of them would paint fakes and then the other one would be like a dealer and he would like approach a bunch of American millionaires. I'm assuming like new money kind of people and be like, hey, like we got this fucking whatever. Like they would show them like this art. And, uh, you know, and the dumb suckers would buy it. So they kind of had, like, a whole thing going on. And they think maybe that Van Meegeren was, like, up with those people. Um, so, yeah. So basically, <laughs> they sold a bunch of stuff to this guy who was um, named Widener. P.A.B. P Widener. And he was, like, a big streetcar magnate, like, back in the day when streetcars were, like, a thing. And he had bought, like, a fuck ton of art from them. And then, but, like, later on, he found out that his whole collection uh, was worth, like, about 5% of what he had originally been charged for it because they were pretty much all fakes. So there was that. Now, one thing that uh, this particular guy, Theo Van Wingarten, did, he came up with a paint medium, which, like I said, that's something you mix with your paint, like, when you're painting on the canvas. It was this kind of, like, gelatin glue and what this glue would do was, because when an, an oil painting is being, uh, you know, they're seeing if it's auth when it's being authenticated, one of the things they'll do is they'll rub the painting with alcohol. Because if the alcohol is, or if the paint isn't that old, because oil paint uh, takes a really, really long time to dry. So if this oil paint is only like a few years old, uh, then the alcohol will dissolve it. Now, if the painting is a few hundred years old, then the alcohol won't dissolve it because it's had enough time to harden. dry yeah. and harden. So apparently this guy has developed this gelatin glue that will kind of like circumvent the alcohol test. Hmm. Um, and he had made like a bunch of fakes and sold them to this American millionaire. Um, the problem was that even though this gelatin glue uh, worked on the alcohol test, if you got the painting wet, uh, it would like soften and kind of like start to fall off, like just with water. Like if you rubbed alcohol on it, it was fine. But if you put water on it, it would like start. So, you know, you can't win them all, I guess. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so the whole thing about that, so Van, uh, so this guy, like Van Wingarten, these names are killing me, these Dutch names. Now, he was a painter himself, 
but he didn't he wasn't a good enough painter to like pass off fakes of like you know really good artists right so when he found van meegeren who had studied like a lot of the old dutch masters and kind of like knew a lot of their techni- techniques and knew a lot how, of how they painted like uh you know their the way that they painted um he's just like yeah well we need to like hook up and you need to paint some paintings and i'll like help you pass them off so as i mentioned earlier Van Meegeren was, you know, a pretty popular painter in his own right, like before he even started forging stuff. Um, Now, he did paint some copies in 1923. He did um, a painting uh, called The Happy Smoker, and he did one called The Laughing Cavalier, which were, um, they weren't copies of actual paintings, but they were in the style of Franz Hals. But he didn't, like, try to pass them off as that. So, like I said, that's something that a lot of painters do. They'll copy paintings or do something in the style of that, like, to see if they can do it, like, for practice. But he wasn't, at this point, like, trying to pass them off as actually by that artist. Now, uh, at this point, too, I kind of feel like the critics were getting even more mad because they're just kind of like, look, you're just copying stuff by, like, old Dutch masters. Like I said, like Peter de Hooch or, uh, you know, or Franz Hals or whatever. And it's just like, why don't you do your own shit? Uh, And he wasn't doing that. Now, at this point, so he moves to The Hague, right? And then he uh, had kind of, like, thrown over his first wife. And then he hooked up with this other woman whose name was uh johanna de boer and she was an actress so she was a little bit more like libertine i guess uh and he was kind of into that and they were actually together for a really long time we'll like talk about that later but um and i guess she kind of like put up with it because i think he kind of like uh was kind of a little bit of a man whore a little bit well, I mean, um, he's got to do what he's got to do, you know. And he was kind of, he was also an alcoholic. Yeah, well, you know. So there, so, so got there a was, lot of time on his hands. So there was that. <laughs> and apparently, like, she just put up with it, I guess. Um, story goes that uh, that Van Meegeren, and, like, once he started, like, making some money, he had, uh, you know, once he started like, kind of, like, doing the forgery hope thing. Yeah. He actually had a separate party house. Like, he had his house and he had the party house. That's where you'd bring the girls. And, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and it's, yeah, they bring the prostitutes yeah. in, and he had, like, yeah. little, uh, reportedly, he had, like, little, like, uh, treasure chests, like, full of jewels, and it's yeah. like, hey, take what you want, you know what yeah. I mean? It's all here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mississippi has those. They call them fucking hunting lodges <laughs> and, and fishing cabins. That's where you take the girlfriend. Yeah, that's kind of, like, what he, yeah. what he had going on. Yeah. That's kind of what he had going on. Uh, but yeah, so remember how I, I mentioned earlier that he really hated Vincent Van Gogh? This is, um, so what I was going to say is that even though a lot of people still think of Han Van Meegeren as like, you know, national, Dutch national hero and stuff like that, but one thing that he did say in regards to, uh, modern art and how much he hated it was that, um, he started publishing, like, once the critics started, like, getting on his ass about why you just, like, reproducing, like, all this old shit... He had a little uh, magazine that he put out every month. I don't know what the circulation of it was. But he started, like, writing all these articles in it, and he basically called um, his uh, modern painting, the proponents of modern painting are a slimy bunch of woman haters and Negro lovers. That's what he called them. Um, And basically he called the, uh, a symbol of the international art market was a Jew with a hand cart. (laughs) So I was like, okay. So like I said. What's the hand cart mean? I have no idea. Going around trying to make money? I guess. Okay. Like, hey, put all the money in here. Yeah, put the money in here. So like I said, he just. Cheap ass art. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So the narrative goes that he's like, oh, I'm this big genius and nobody loves me and nobody recognizes it. So I'm going to prove to the art critics that I can do more than copy, you know, these old classical artists. I'm going to produce something that's like so awesome that you guys are just it's going to be as good as theirs and I'll be able to fool everybody. So at this point, he takes his girlfriend slash wife, uh, the actress. They go off to the south of France and he is like, I'm going to produce like the ultimate forgery. 
But like I said, you have to admire his chutzpah because he spent a long time doing this, okay? And I'm not going to say, like, he didn't half-ass it. I'm she say. said chutzpah. I did. Jenny became Yiddish all of a sudden. <laughs> what? It's a word? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I can use that word if I want to. <laughs> so, yeah. So they, so they go there, and he spends, like, six years um, developing his techniques. Now, there's kind of a lot of debate over how much... That's very distracting, you know. I'm sorry. She's, there throw, she's throwing stuff. Okay. Yeah, he's like back there, like moving around, and I'm just kind of like, yeah, my she, shit's going no, all Pookie's on her back, stuff. fucking throwing shit at me, and I'm throwing it back. She's so funny. She's got the little fucking, the little black mouse. She's biting it, and she threw it at me. I threw it back. Funny. Yeah. I've never seen her throw anything at me. You yeah. throwing stuff? She threw it at me, and I threw it back to her, and then she fucking she dropped it. Man, right over she's there. eating that mouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why you eat it? Yeah. She's eating it. Yeah, she threw something at me. That was the first time. I was like, wow. Oh. Yeah. Danny Rowling said this guy looks like he was one of the crew members on the Death Star in Star Wars. Yeah. He does a little bit, like, in the picture. I didn't see a lot of pictures of him as a, as a young person. I kind of feel like most of the pictures you see of him online are, like, when he was old, because that's, like, after he got arrested. But, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, a lot of people don't know how much his wife... Uh, Johanna knew about what he was doing. I kind of suspect she probably knew, but she probably didn't give a shit because he eventually started making like millions and millions of dollars off of it. And she's just kind of like, whatever, as long as we're like, have a good lifestyle, I don't give a crap. So yeah, so they moved to the French Riviera um, because I kind of feel like the more, like when he started selling the forgeries and they started making all this money, like, you know, people wouldn't like ask him about it because he wasn't, you know, in his home country anymore. That moonshine's so, kicking ass, Jenny. Yeah. I'm going to have to slow down on that moonshine. Well, yeah, you're just, you're already kind of like yeah, yeah, man. moving around and I'm like moving. doing. Yeah. You're always doing yeah, all I'm this. Yeah, I'm going to have to fucking let it wear off. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this isn't like a hugely complicated show, but yeah, it's just yeah. like, I don't want it to be like all. Okay. I don't want it to like yeah, last storm, all night. Yeah, we got a storm coming and I got pizza getting ready to go down. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. That sounds good. Oh, yeah. And, and it's that heavy bread crust dough. Oh, okay. So it's going to be good. Okay. All right. So, like I said, as practice, like, he starts doing uh, Gerard Tabor, she starts doing Franz Hals, he starts doing, like, all these kind of, like, famous uh, Dutch masters, and he did some by Johannes Vermeer. Now, he finally says, okay, what am I going to do for my ultimate forgery that I'm going to fool everybody with? He chose a painting by, by Vermeer, uh, and it was probably, probably the best thing for him to do because Vermeer um, was... A well-known painter in his time, but then he'd kind of been a little bit forgotten about. Um, but then he kind of had a resurgence, like right around 1850, 1860. Um, and so his work started to get like really, really valuable. And they were also really scarce because Vermeer, that they know <coughs> of, only produced about 35 paintings that, you know, that are definitely attributed to him during his lifetime. So... Uh, so Van Meegeren figures, well, everybody's super into Vermeer now. Um, it's right in my wheelhouse. Like, that's exactly what I can paint. I know how he, you know, ground his paints. I know how he worked. And people are, collectors are really, really looking for more. I mean, 35 paintings, that's it by this guy. So it's like he had to have painted more than that, like, during his life. So he's like, so collectors are going to be, like, really, if you kind of come up with a lost Vermeer, that's going to be, like, a big deal, and I can get a lot of money. So it was probably, like, the best artist that he could have particularly picked because, like I said, there weren't really a lot of authenticated Vermeers floating around back then. Still aren't, actually. Um, so he went all in. He goes all into, like, uh, read all their biographies, uh, you know, their lives, their whole, uh, the way that they, uh, you know, all of their paintings, like how they painted, the techniques, the way they mixed their paints, everything. Um, interestingly, and this was kind of like, uh, kind of an interesting, I don't know if it was a coincidence, but there's a guy named Dr. Abraham Bredius, and he was like a um, Rembrandt expert. And he published an article in late 1932, and he um, was talking about two recently discovered, ver well, they were supposedly Vermeer paintings that had just been, you know, discovered. And one of them was a landscape, um, which Vermeer didn't do a lot of landscapes, not that I remember. And uh, there was another one with like a man and woman, like at a spinet or like a piano thing. Um, now, he thought that the landscape one was fake, but that the other one was probably, like, authentic. So 
that kind of I think that made Van Meegeren and be like, ooh, now I'm no, I'm really on the right track because everybody's like talking about here's this guy that's like a Rembrandt expert and he's just like talking about these new Vermeers that they found and he's like, I'm gonna find some Vermeers too, you know what I mean? So at this point, him and his wife, they move to this village and rent this big ass mansion, which is called Primavera. And he starts like working on all of the chemical and like technical procedures that is gonna because like I said, it's not just painting the shit that looks like the classic thing, but you have to make it look like it's from that year, which is not as easy as it sounds. So what he would do was he would go and buy like kind of shitty or like mediocre paintings from that time period. Um, you know, the same time period where the painting that he wanted to forge was from like 17th century in this case. And then he would start mixing his own paints from raw materials. Like I said, you know, so you'd have like white lead, you had indigo, cinnabar, all that kind of stuff. And then he would use the old formulas as much as was possible so that if anybody went in there with like chemical analysis, that it would look like paint from that time period. He also went as far as creating his own badger hair paint brushes uh, because that's what Vermeer used. So he wanted it exactly the same. Um, one of the genius things that he did, and this is one of the things that I remember the most, I don't know why, like from the book that I read about him, he came up with this uh, plan where he would use essentially Bakelite uh, and he'd yeah. mix it in with the paint. Bakelite. That's weird. Yeah, and it yeah. would, um, you know, phenylformaldehyde is what that is. And he would mix it into the paints and then when the paints, so the paints would harden like really, really quickly. Yeah. So chemically it would seem <clears throat> like it had, it was like 300 years old. What because year like was I, this again? Um, this was 1930s. Okay. Early ba 1930s. Bakelite is the prototype for plastic. Yep, yep, yep. Soviets started using it in the 40s for machine gun furniture and stuff. Weird. Ended up on the AK-47. Bakelite. Yep. You only found that shit really in the time she's talking about. You only found Bakelite and things like pot handles for fucking cooking pots because it would isolate heat pretty well. Weird material. Weird. Long gone. Long gone. You never see Bakelite anymore. It's very collectible nowadays, yeah, actually. Yeah. It's kind of it was kind of a hard, glossy, resiny feeling plastic, but it wasn't really plastic. I don't think it came from petroleum products like plastic does. It comes from other stuff. But yeah, that's what he used like to make the paint harden really quick. Because remember how I said earlier, yeah. like a lot of times if they thought something was fake, they put alcohol on it. Because if the paint yeah. hadn't dried for decades or centuries then the shit would rub right off. It's weird. But Bakelite, if you mixed it in with it the paint, harden up and it, it would harden up it would harden up and it wouldn't yeah. rub off. Good thing. So, Good yeah, thing. like I said, so you did have to get, you know, you did have to give him credit for that for figuring that <clears> out. <throat> uh, he would also mix his paints with lilac oil, uh, which would kind of like stop the paints from fading or yellowing, like when he applied heat to them, which is, which is coming up. Um, and one thing he would do, because he didn't want anybody to catch him doing that, he always kept, like, um, bouquets of lilacs, like, in his studio. So everybody would be like, oh, it smells like lilac in here. And it's like, oh, it's just those. So, you know what I mean? He didn't want anybody to think that he was bored and shit. Um, so after he did all that, uh, you know, he'd put the bake light in the paint. He would paint the painting. And then he would bake it. He'd bake the, bake the painting. Uh, about 100 degrees centigrade, which is, uh, you know, 212 Fahrenheit, uh, to harden the paint. And then he would take the painting and roll it over a cylinder, like to get the, the cracks, you know what I mean? Because, you know, paintings that are 300 years old have a bunch of uh, cracks in them. And then he would take black India ink and he'd like kind of like wash it over the whole thing so that like dirt, like black would go down into the cracks so it would look old. So that's what he did. Um, like I said, it took about six years. And if you want to know more about it, it's actually like fascinating. I got like really into like the science behind it. Um, there's a couple of really good books about him. I think they both came out in 2008. Um, you can find just Han Van Meegeren in 2008, whatever. And um, one of the books that I read like went really into his methods, and it was like really interesting. Glenn's asking when they stopped making Bakelite. Last time I saw Bakelite was in the mid-90s. I bought a Rat Mill Cougar AK-74 rifle from uh, Romania, and it had Bakelite pistol grip on it. Just the pistol grip, not the buttstock or the the forearms. And they had ba orange Bakelite. That's the last time I've seen it. It was in the 90s, and that was Romania. 
but it seemed to be Bakelite. So. Yeah, I'd have to look that up because yeah. I just remember seeing like years ago that I don't know about now, but I remember years ago like seeing some Antiques Roadshow or something like that, and they were talking about like how um, there was like a kind of a resurgence in people that collected stuff that was made of Bakelite, like from back in the day, but. I don't know if that's still like ongoing because they made all kind of stuff about out of that back then. So, so yeah. So like I said, it took him about six years and he painted a bunch of um, paintings, like practice ones that he didn't sell. Like he did, um, they weren't exactly copies of Vermeer paintings, but they were like in the style of Vermeer. He did one called like Lady Reading Music, um, which was kind of similar to an actual Vermeer painting. And um, that's actually still on display. It's in the Wrights Museum in Amsterdam. And he did another one uh, that was based off of Vermeer's uh, Woman with a Loot Near a Window, uh, which is in the Met. Um, so I've actually been to the Met, so I've seen like some of Vermeer's paintings in real life. Uh, I don't know if I, I don't remember if I saw any Han, Han Van Meegeren ones. I kind of feel like I did, but I can't remember. It was a long time ago. So like I said, these two he didn't sell. He, the, he just did them for practice, see if he could pull it off. So 1936, Van Meegeren uh, paints he, his uh, kind of like first big Vermeer forgery. And this was uh, the Supper at Emmaus. Now he used like the same kind of like blues and yellows that they would have used back then that Vermeer would have used. Now what he had done, like I said, he would usually buy like shitty old paintings or not shitty, but like just ones that weren't you know, worth anything like from the era so he could have the canvas and kind of use it as a, you know, as, as a base or whatever. So he bought this painting from the 17th century, like a Dutch painting that was called The Awakening of Lazarus. And then he used that as like the base, the canvas. So basically what he decided to do was that because a lot of uh, Vermeer experts thought that Vermeer had studied in Italy. And I'm not sure if that's the case, but everybody thought that it was. So Van Meegeren probably very intelligently decided, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to, if I'm gonna paint uh, Supper at Emmaus, which is like a big, uh, you know, uh, topic that a lot of painters from back then painted, um, you know, Bible kind of thing. So he's like, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna use the Caravaggio Supper at Emmaus and I'm going to base it off of that, like the composition, because it's like then that makes it look like Vermeer painted it, but he had been studying in Italy and was looking at Caravaggio's work. And he's like, so like I said, he wasn't dumb. He like knew what he was, and he kind of knew his market too. You know what I mean? So he's like, that's what I'm gonna do. So he painted it like that. Now, the thing about it, here's one thing, and I kind of want to get into this a little bit later too, because I've seen actual Vermeers. And the painting, even, and the Supper at Emmaus is probably Van Meegeren's best forgery. And it's not very good. Even me, a layman who has just seen a few Vermeers in real life and has seen a bunch of them in books, knows that that's not a Vermeer. It just doesn't look like, it's similar but it doesn't look like an actual Vermeer. Maybe so some people just want to believe. Well, I think that was a big deal yeah. because like I said, Vermeer had just kind of come back into vogue and he didn't paint that many paintings in his life, at least that people know of. So collectors were like really, really, it was kind of like a hot commodity. So if somebody comes out and it kind of looks like a Vermeer, but he's like, yeah, sure, it's a Vermeer, you know, and they'll buy it because they want, they want it to be. They a want it to be a Vermeer, but like because that was the best one, and they didn't get any better. Like they just kind of got the quality of them got worse and worse. Like as right. time went on, um, I'm not saying that Van Meegeren was a bad painter. It's just that his Vermeers don't look like Vermeers to me. Like even just from my unpracticed eye, they really don't look that. They're not terrible, but you can tell that's not a Vermeer. It's not the same. But uh, so yeah. What he did with this one. So he could paint the shit, right? He had all the techniques right. It looked like an old painting. It was on an old canvas, all that kind of stuff. But the problem with it, it's not so much painting it and faking it, is that how do you get this out into the market without anybody being suspicious? So what he would do 
he kind of had some connections early on, but I guess like as time went on, he kind of like lost touch with them. So he started like developing his own con. So he would basically try to trick innocent people like friends of his into like bringing the shit into the market on his behalf. So on this particular painting, um, he knew this guy named Gerard Boone, who, uh, interestingly, he was kind of like um, a parliamentarian, like from the Liberal State Party in uh, in the Netherlands, and was a big advocate of like the right of women to vote and stuff like that. Now, uh, so Van Meegeren, I guess, kind of knew this guy, and so he convinced him that it's like, oh, this painting, uh, originally, it's a Vermeer, and it belonged to this Dutch family who were in Italy, and they got persecuted by the fascists, and they need some money to get out of the country and go to the United States, so can you find a buyer for me? Uh, you know, and this was bullshit. Now, interestingly, it's kind of interesting because Boone was actually kind of more like a, a liberal and uh, Van Meegeren, by all accounts, was more like an ultra right kind of person, which, like I said, is really funny that he's gone down in history as being like, ooh, we fucked over the Nazis. He was kind of a Nazi sympathizer. Um, like I said, the fact that he fooled the Nazis, that was just kind of incidental. He didn't really mean for you're that just to a happen. Dude, you're just a dude who can move in those circles and you've got to be like those guys. You yeah. just, it's just, you know, it's how a con man works. But yeah, he passed this painting off <laughs> yeah. as, like, he knew how to appeal to this guy. So he's like, oh, this family, yeah. and it's like they yeah. got fucked over by the fascists in Italy, and it's like they need some money. It's a Vermeer. They really need to sell it. So uh, so Boone was like, okay, that's that's fine. So he shows the painting to the guy I mentioned earlier, the Rembrandt uh, expert, whose name was uh, Abraham Bredius, who was an art historian. And so Bredius looks at this forgery in 1937, and he accepted it as a genuine Vermeer and thought it was a masterpiece. Like I said, it's not a terrible painting, but I don't know. Maybe knowing what I know, I'm just looking at it going, eh, it doesn't look exactly like a Vermeer to me, but I don't know. Now, um, all of the tests, they did do scientific tests on it and shit like that. Like they did all kind of like the white lead analysis, the x-rays, all that kind of stuff. And the painting like passed all the tests because he knew, like I said, Van Bingeren wasn't a dummy. He knew what he was doing. So he did try to, like, make everything as, you know, he tried to lock everything down, like, as much as possible. And it did work for, like, a very long time. Now, the painting was actually purchased by the Rembrandt Society for, uh, at that time, 520,000 florins, which is about, which is 4.6 million euros today. Um, and then it was donated to a, a museum in Rotterdam. And they also had like this big, in 1938, that this big special exhibition, like, oh, look at this Vermeer we just found, blah, 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 with like a bunch of other like old, uh, like legitimate assumed, uh, you know, Dutch masters. So at this point, like, you know, uh, Van Meegeren is like cha-ching, he's like cashed in. 1938, he moves to Nice in France and uh, buys a 12 bedroom estate. So he made Damn. like a fuck ton of money. Yeah, this dude made a lot of money a lot um so while he was at this mansion he actually painted a couple more forgeries uh he did one called interior with card players and interior with drinkers which were both they weren't vermeers they were actually uh peter de hooch uh who was another very famous dutch painter and uh he also painted a last supper in the style of vermeer now, he went back to the Netherlands in September of 1939 uh, as the Second World War was kind of looming. Now, throughout 1941, he actually kind of put out a book of um, this big, huge, like, really fancy uh, book of all his drawings. And uh, so he did that, and he did a bunch of forgeries around this time, too. Like, uh, you know, just a whole bunch of uh, Vermeer copies like he did a fuck ton of them it wasn't just Vermeer but I think that's the ones that he was the most famous for and that's kind of the ones that he did during this time period now interestingly like I said he wasn't a dummy there's a lot of things you could say about Van Beegeren but he wasn't stupid December 1943 he actually divorced his wife but he didn't really divorce he only legally divorced her like they kept uh, living together he was starting to make so much money that he put a bunch of money in her name and he's like, hey, if I ever get busted or caught or anything like that, 
and they make me like they take all my money or my estate or whatever he wanted a place to like put it so he put the shit all in her name and then he divorced her so they wouldn't have any like legal thing but they still kept living together and it did actually kind of like work out so yeah they uh they didn't know what was going to happen because the war was coming so he put all the money in her name so in 1943, late 1943, they moved to Amsterdam, and then they uh, they got this like super super fancy house. Now, like I said, his forgeries at this point had earned him um, about by today's money about thirty million dollars. Damn, thirty million rich motherfucker. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, he I'm bought, in the wrong business, right? Fuck all this YouTube. Let's go forward <laughs> some shit. Man. Well, don't think I haven't thought about yeah, it. Yeah, well, like I said, fucking paintings. The thing about it is like. You kind of, it's harder to forge, obviously, it's harder to forge stuff from centuries ago. Yeah. Because there's a lot of, like, cause, and and they know all the tricks. They Now they have everything, like, they can tell. And he got busted later on Hit for, like, some shit, Hit your ass with that too. electron microscope. That's then what I'm what saying. what are you going to do? That's what I mean. Then they'll be like, well, it's fake. Yeah. And it's very, very easy. <laughs> um, you know, and actually, he like I said, he got busted back then, too. But nowadays, it'd be super easy. So I kind of feel like if you're going to forge some art, like, forge something more recent, it'd be easier. Like, if you try to, like, forge stuff from, like, the fucking 17th century, unless probably, you really want to, like, go all in on that shit, because that's going to cost you a lot of money to, like, fucking... Probably be better to forge some Roman coins and shit like that. Probably be a lot easier. But they may not be the buyers. Who knows? You got to know exactly what you're doing. That's what I'm what saying. And that's why, in some ways, I'm not as mad at, like, Art Forge. Because look at all of the fucking knowledge that you have to have to even want to get into this stuff. Yeah. You're go- I mean, if unless you know what you're doing, you're going to get caught, like, immediately. Yeah. So You got to know the scene. That's what I Those mean. Those dudes are from the scene. Yeah. For, yeah, you have to. You don't have to. You have to know what people want. What will yeah. people buy? And then you have to know. Well, how can I fake that? So yeah. it's a like a lot of work. It's a lot of. I mean, if you're gonna do that much work, you might as well just get a real job. You know what I'm saying? And in order to sell it, you had to be known. Right. The only way to get known is you got to sell real shit first. Right. So you got to build up the con. That's what I'm saying. So it's almost unless like, you're an art thief, you can yeah. just steal the shit and then hold it for ransom, and that happens too. Yeah. Yeah. But you got to have a foolproof. And you better be, be ready to go to jail because that's part of the bargaining process. Yeah. And if you let me out of jail, I'll give you the fucking painting. But you got to pay a certain Man, that money. one guy does that like right, like yeah. every fucking yeah, couple of years or so. But he's willing to be in jail three, four, five years. He's just like, ah, whatevs. Yeah, he didn't give a shit. He nah. goes, no, I can get the painting for you. But you got <laughs> to let me out and you got to pay a certain amount of money. And I, I think I know who has it. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the game. That's what he's decided he wants to, which... Right, yeah. Hey, if that's yeah. the way you want to make money, then that's yeah. up to you. He's sitting there doing fucking Shaolin fucking Buddhist monk stuff while fucking Tai Chi while he's locked up. Fucking saying, I'm willing to wait. And he really was doing fucking Which, martial yeah, arts. Like fucking, I'm willing to wait. You know, if they want that painting back. They're going to fucking yield. You know, I don't have it, but I think I can get it. I think I know who has it. It's going to take a certain amount of money. Yeah. They're going to want a certain amount of money. So it's like he's essentially holding them for ransom. Yeah. That's like his whole business model. Yeah. Yeah. And then once I get this for you, you got to get me out of here. You know, so, but they know he fucking stole that shit. He and his, he and his boys stole it. Well, yeah, but yeah. knowing it and proving it are two he different can't things. can't prove it, though. That's, and that's yeah. what he's relying yeah, yeah. on. He's like, well, yeah, you can know it all you want, but if you can't prove it, then, right. then you got to let me out. Right. Which, like I said, if that's the way you want to make money, fine. I'm just saying that it's like... Even though Han Van Meegeren kind of sounded like, I don't know, in some ways he kind of sounded like a douche, but you do have to kind of respect that he went all in with this forgery thing. Like, he made, yeah, he made a shitload of money out of it, but that's a lot of work, though. Like I said, I think that's probably more work than I would be willing to put in. And even and I like this kind of shit, but I'm like, if I'm going to put that much work in, I'd rather just, like, paint my own original shit and, like, hope somebody likes it enough to give me a million dollars for it. You know what I'm saying? Instead of just, like, fucking... Yeah, I gotta bake the shit and like mix it with all this and do all this chemistry and stuff like that. Fuck that. So yeah, so he had earned about thirty million dollars in today's money uh, from his all of his forgeries that he'd done, mostly Vermeers, but not all. And he bought a fuck ton of real estate. He bought a fuck ton of like expensive jewelry of other people's art. He bought that too, um, and was like, you know, living the high life, man. And he actually claimed in 1946 that he had. 52 houses. I don't know if that's true or if he was just bragging. 
and 15 country houses. And some of those houses were kind of like those mansions, like right along the canals, like in Amsterdam and stuff. I don't know if he really had that much property, if he was just like, you know, dick swinging or whatever, but he did actually like say that he had. <laughs> I'm like, what are you gonna do with 52 houses? Actually more than 52 houses, 52 houses and 15 country houses. You can't live in all those houses at once. Why are you wasting your money like that? So, um, so this is how the motherfucker got caught. And it's almost kind of like, I don't know if it's irony or it's something, but it's something like that. So in 1942, like when, uh, the Germans were occupying the Netherlands, what ended up happening was that somebody, not, ha not Han Van Meegeren, like directly, but one of his agents that he had out there, like selling his forgeries to people. Cause you can't just like be the artist, you know, you have to have like a middleman, like doing that shit. So he had like agents like selling the shit to people. So one of his agents sold one of his Vermeer forgeries, um, which is uh, Christ with the adulteress, I've seen it called, or Christ with the woman taken in adultery, I've seen it called that as well. So somebody, one of his agents sold that to the Nazi banker and art dealer, uh, Alo Alois Meidel, 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 whatever. Um, my German's not good either. I was mighty. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so he sells it to that guy. Now, as I said, this forgery, really, the supper at, uh, at Emmaus was really his best forgery. Like, all the other ones, he did as time went on, he, he got richer and richer. He also got drunker and drunker. Um, and he also chain-smoked and was also a morphine addict. So his uh, forgeries got a little bit less awesome as time went on. Some of the later ones I've seen pictures of, I mean, they it wasn't exactly like kindergarten kind of shit, but I was just kind of like, really? That fooled somebody? All right. Do you want so, any more of that? Yeah. Yeah. That, all right. Might as well. Uh, but yeah, so it wasn't great is what I'm saying, like the quality of it. But regardless, uh, this person bought it, like the Nazi banker bought it. Um... And the thing about it, too, was that it's not like a lot of the genuine Vermeers, like I said, there weren't that many of them in circulation. Most of the museums that had had genuine Vermeers, like obviously because of the war, they had put them in protective storage. So like the Nazis wouldn't steal them or they wouldn't get blown up or whatever. So no one was really like looking at Vermeers every day. So it's just kind of like, yeah, that's a, OK, full, close enough. You know what I mean? So they weren't like they didn't have anything to like compare it to really like right in front of their face. So it didn't have to be fucking great, and it wasn't. So he bought it. Now, so uh, so from there, like uh, Alois Meidel, he tra he passed it on to uh, good old Hermann Goring. Hermann Goring. Now he actually ended up Goring actually traded a hundred and thirty seven paintings that they had looted, obviously for this one supposed Vermeer painting. And he was so proud of that shit that he hung it in his house. You know what I mean? Because he apparently thought it was a, a real or didn't care that it was, wasn't real. Now, uh, so in 1943, Goring actually hid this whole collection of the looted artwork, including this Han Van Meegeren that he thought was a Vermeer, in that uh, famed Austrian salt mine, yeah, uh, along with almost seven thousand other pieces of artwork, which had been looted by the Nazis. Yeah. Now the Allied forces actually in uh, May of 1945 actually entered the salt mine and found all of that stuff. And if you're interested in, there's a great fucking book. I can't remember who wrote it, but it was called The Monuments Men, and it was all about that uh, that whole unit and their whole job was to like go find all the art that the yeah. Nazis had looted. It's a great fucking book. It wasn't just art down that mine either. It was a bunch of money and fucking gold bullion and everything. Uh -huh. They had a shit ton of stuff. Big fucking bars of gold. Yeah. I remember when that, I remember fucking seeing all about that. Yeah. But what I was saying was that, um, you missed it, but Goring actually traded, he thought this yeah. painting was a real Vermeer. And he traded 137 of the looted paintings for that one, oh, thinking dumbass. that it was. He didn't know he was looking at. Yeah. And it wasn't even a good one. It wasn't yeah. even a good fake. But it was a good sales pitch that I the guess. dude gave him, and he traded 137 real paintings for it. Fuck. I guess I don't know if like the 130. I don't know what the 137 yeah, yeah. were that he traded. Yeah, maybe. They, I'm assuming they were real ones. Maybe they weren't that valuable. 
Maybe. So you had maybe it's ones that, that he didn't really want. Yeah, or just one. Yeah, maybe. But like I said, I mean Vermeer paintings that was like that were a hot commodity at the time mm-hmm. because he didn't Vermeer didn't paint that many. Yeah. So you know what I mean. And he was kind of yeah, like they, they, having a moment. <laughs> Reportedly, Goring would put his toga on, and he had an art appreciation room that was all decked out like something out of ancient Rome where he'd sit up there on one of those damn Roman couches and fucking drink and shoot fucking morphine. Did he have somebody feed him grapes? If, yeah, stuff, evidently you know, he had like fucking waitresses and shit bringing him stuff and they'd bring art out to him so he could look at it. And while they were playing phonograph fucking records and shit. <laughs> That's so weird to me. Like, why? Like, hey, I like going to... He thought to, he was a fucking Roman noble. I like going to museums and looking at art yeah. as much as the next guy, but it's just kind of like, why? Yeah. I don't see what's so exciting about just, like, laying there, having somebody drop grapes in your mouth. He's just, and, the, like, just kind of a upper middle class or middle class bored. dude trying to be an aristocrat, you know? Fucking conquering the world, you know? Fucking... Yeah, how'd that From go? their point of view, fucking saving Western civilization from fucking, you know deterioration and shit and fucking um whatever dudes yeah (laughs) Yeah, but they didn't you know what i mean fucking it was (laughs) he was a man of his time you know fucking but it's just fucking hilarious ridiculous he was a junkie mostly you know a lot of them were they were just ridiculous the clowny, clownish kind of guy. So silly Nazis. Yeah. They were. I mean, yeah. And yeah. honestly, she's not really they, lying. If I'm you not, actually go into the details, they, they were. There wasn't much to those dudes. I mean, that's what I mean. And I'm not trying. I'm not being glib. I'm not trying yeah, to like yeah. minimize what they did because yeah. obviously they did. Like that was fucking horrific. But I think it's better to got to be realistic. Demean people like that for the fucking, even though the the consequences of their stupidity. And their fucking silliness is horrible, but I think it's better. It's just kind of like serial killers. I always kind of like make fun of their dick size and stuff yeah. like that because I don't well, know. Just the whole thing is like ridiculous. It wasn't me. just them. They were in a fight between the, the fucking Soviets, and they were both bad. And it's just it was just part of the European scene, and they both. It started off, it was a fucking fight to the death between two empires that were fucking extreme. They both were. And they kind of beat each other into that shape. But the dudes that were behind it, even including Stalin and stuff, if you actually look at the details, the personal... Stalin was a street thug and a fucking robber, basically, who ended up joining a revolutionary party. He was a fucking street assassin. He was a little bitty fucking five foot three fucking kind of a nobody but he was real ruthless and smart um he knew how to turn people one against the other he's a fantastic divider um so you know yeah they were fucked up but in europe was fucked up at that time they were just it had been taken over basically by fucking gangs you know well and i kind of feel like people like that People with that kind of mindset that they have, they really need to be like, they need to get the fuck over themselves is what they need to do. A lot of it had to do with ideology. Reading too many books and believing bullshit. Both sides. Pie in the sky thinking. Magical thinking. Uh, Trying to be more than what you are. Uh, There's a lot of stuff involved with that. Uh, Believing 100% that you're the good guy. And but it was just but man come on let's be honest all of European history is kind of like that going all the way back to fucking ancient Rome Greece the Spartans kind of extreme I think a lot of things would be better if more people would just like get the fuck over themselves I think a lot of it had to do with the technological limitations of the time uh, things were run by fucking governments and governments are a certain way uh, nowadays, you don't need need them like you used to. I mean, most of Washington D.C. is just empty buildings, people pretending like they're working. Fucking the internet does a lot of it. <clears throat> the internet and fucking companies are doing uh, doing most of it. Back in the days when all that, I don't want to. I'm getting off topic. Go ahead. Yeah, no kidding. It's it's, um, it's all obsolete. It's all obsolete, and it was kind of obsolete back then a little bit. What they were doing. So, okay, so this is how Han van Meegeren ended up getting caught. Because what happened 
was that when they found the salt mine with all the paintings in it, including that Van Meegeren one that Goring thought was a Vermeer, the Allied forces questioned the Nazi banker who had bought the painting in the first place and got it into Goring's hands, Meidel. And because he had kept meticulous records, as Nazis tended to do, they actually, uh, the authorities actually traced the painting back to Van Meegeren. That's what the provenance of it was. So Van Meegeren actually got arrested in May of 1945, and he was actually charged not with forgery, because they thought it was a Vermeer. He was charged with fraud and also aiding and abetting the enemy. Like, they were essentially like, you're taking Dutch cultural, uh, you know, artifacts and selling them to the Nazis. Um, so that's what actually they arrested him for. There was no, nobody knew anything about forgery at this point. So he gets sent to prison uh, as an alleged Nazi collaborator um, because he was, again, like plundering Dutch property, like cultural property and selling it to the Nazis. And they were not happy about that. Uh, and they were actually going to give him the death penalty because that's what the, uh, you know, that's, that's what the penalty for that was. Now, uh, he kind of like thought about it. He's like, well, shit, um, I'm kind of in a pickle at this point. Uh, if I say that this is actually a Vermeer, then I'm going to get hanged or whatever. Um, but if I say that I painted it, then I'm also going to get in trouble because that's also illegal. In the end, uh, he's like, well, I guess forgery isn't doesn't have a death penalty, so I'm just going to say that I painted it. So he's basically like, uh, what he said, his quote was, the painting in Goring's hands is not, as you assume, a Vermeer of Delft, but a Van Meegeren. I painted the picture. So they actually had to verify this for a while. And like I said, the first time that I read about this guy was in an article called He Paints for His Life, and it... It leaned very hard into the whole they made him paint a painting like in the courtroom, like while everybody was looking, which they did because they were kind of like they were trying to prove that he actually uh, could paint it. And he, and he did paint one. Now, he actually painted his last forgery uh, in the courtroom with everybody watching like over a few month period. And it was called Jesus Among the Doctors, or sometimes called Young Christ in the Temple. And it was like a Vermeer style painting. And he's just like, see, see, I can paint like Vermeer. And they were like, oh, okay, suppose so. Um, so basically, uh, here's the thing. So not only did he paint the painting in the courtroom, like to show everybody that he had actually done it and could actually do it. Um, he also kind of spun a little bit of a narrative once he got caught that, uh, yeah, I fucked over the Nazis. And I'm also, by the way, a super Dutch patriot because I got Goring to give me back 137 Dutch paintings for this one fake one. He's spinning the fucking So, narrative. yeah. But that's how he played it. Yeah. And he, everybody was just kind of like, all right, yeah, he's yeah, a hero. Yeah, well, that's a good way to play it. That was, I mean, what else could he have Propaganda. done? Propaganda, really? yeah, yeah. What else could he yeah. have done? It works. Propaganda works. The judge didn't, like, buy it at first. He was just kind of like... Um, you got to see how you're spinning it. He yeah. said... Uh, <laughs> the judge says to him at one point, you do admit, though, that you sold these pictures for very high prices. Van Meegeren said, <laughs> I could hardly have done otherwise. Had I sold them for low prices, it would have been obvious they were fake. Yeah. And I was just like, eh, that was a good answer. Okay, I, guess yeah. I got you. Um, he countered it. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I'm saying. But he did very much, and I think it was very successful, like the way that they spun it, like where, you know, he said, hey, I got Goring to give me 137 paintings, which maybe would have been lost. Right, yeah. If, you know, and I'm saving, like, Dutch cultural. You're right, right. So he yeah. tried to kind of, like, play it like that. And I kind of feel like that narrative kind of like survived a little bit until probably recent times because it's He's only doing like what a calm man does yeah you, you got it all planned out of what you're gonna say and everything fucking with the good pr yeah okay the thing about it though is that um <coughs> so even though like i said he kind of gets played as like you know a national hero for pulling a fast one on the nazis uh there were a couple of little complicating factors 1945, while Van Meegeren was still in prison, um, a very maybe like uh, unco uncomfortable item turned up in Hitler's private library when they were going through it. 
it was apparently this uh, volume of poems by a Dutch Nazi poet. This book had been illustrated by Han van Meegeren. Okay. And had an inscription in it that said, To my beloved Fuhrer, mm -hmm. in grateful tribute, from H. van Meegeren, Laren, North Holland, mm -hmm. 1942. Yeah. So there's that. Cha -ching. Now, so they asked him about this, and yeah. he said, "Oh well, that's my signature, but I didn't write the rest of that yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. Somebody else must have written that, even though it was all the same <laughs> handwriting." And they're just like, "You're, okay. dealing, you're dealing with a businessman." Yeah, he's just <laughs> trying to like squirm his way out of stuff. You're dealing with a businessman. He's trying to make money where the money is. Also, he didn't really seem to have any compunction about like you know, obviously when Jewish families around him were like rounded up and taken away, like yeah. he bought up all their property, like yeah. ooh. Cashing in, <laughs> cha -ching. and yeah, and it was well, like, what can I do? I can't stop it. That's I what I mean, it. and I'm sure that's how he justified. And, it. and like, it's so, just gonna sit there, and it's gonna go to these Nazis. So if I get it, then yeah, I'm saving. That's exactly. That's how you. I kind of feel like that's yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I kind of feel like that's how his whole yeah. You got. I mean, his angle. family said he was like a lovely person, but I don't know. Yeah. I did, throughout his life, I kind of get the feeling that he was more like a Nazi sympathizer kind of person than, than yeah, like, yeah, I think he was more like an opportunist. Yeah. He's just like, I don't give a shit. I just want like, he would have cited who, he would have cited who was, who, with whoever was in power. And here's the thing is that a lot of people are like that. I think that a lot of people are like that. Whoever's in power, that's who you side with. Cause that's where the money is. He's, he was just one of those. I mean, he just, I mean, like I said, he made a lot of money doing that and yeah. he just wanted to preserve that like as much as possible. <laughs> So you know what I mean? So he didn't really give a shit if he fucked other people over or anything like that. So he's just, I don't know. Like like I said, well, not, he's gonna be like, not evil, but just I, I selfish. Can't, I can't stop this. So right. Make Which, my money. Right. Is what I do. So, I so after he um, you know, <coughs> painted the Vermeer in the courtroom and everybody yeah. said, okay, well, obviously that Vermeer is like, you know, you painted it and it was fake, so whatever. And after he spun this whole narrative, hey, I'm a hero because I saved all these paintings. So when he came out the courtroom, like they had like a whole, like all his fans out there, like cheering for him and everything like that. Um, because obviously, um, you know, collaborating with the Nazis, he would have got the death penalty. But because it went to like the lesser forgery charge, he actually only ended up getting sentenced to a year in prison. I don't even think he served that. Um, now he did have to forfeit his wealth because he had gotten it illegally. But um, remember how earlier I said that he divorced his wife legally and like put a bunch of shit in her name? That's why he did this. Right. So they took a lot of his shit away, but $50 million mm -hmm. was still in her name. Plain enough to retire on. So, well, yeah, but the thing about it was that he dropped dead only two years after. You know, well, he wasn't planning only for Only two that. years later. He wasn't planning for that. His wife, Johanna, lived until she was 91 yeah, in he, very in style because she had yeah, all that, that fucking like, money. She had all that fucking yeah. money. He didn't know that was going to happen. Well, was, no, but yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. Now, yeah. he actually still like painted and stuff like after he got released from prison, and he signed his works with his own name. And because he was famous now, like now he could sell his own paintings like with his own name on them, and like people would buy them because it's like, hey, you're the guy that like fucked over the Nazis. So, um, yeah. So his paintings sold for a lot more than they would have like before yeah. he got outed as a forger. Um, they did an opinion poll in the Netherlands in 1947, and Han van Meegeren was the second most popular person in the nation after the prime minister. So there's that. Uh, so like I said, but that was kind of predicated on the narrative that he was a hero which like i said that's not really not really what happened he that's just kind of how he sold it um but he did kind of like cry about a little bit though like his whole thing uh at his trial he said my triumph as a counterfeiter was my defeat as a creative artist which i was like well you chose your path man i mean you made a lot of money now after he got released or sentenced or released, I don't know if, like I said, if he even served a year, but he actually died only a couple months after he got out. Uh, he died of heart failure, which they think was maybe a complication of uh, syphilis, because like I said, he was kind of a man whore. Uh, he was 58 years old. Relatively young, actually. He was 58, yeah. Yeah, that's not that old. Nope. So that's what happened. Well, 58 was old then, though. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. But like I said, his wife lived till she was 91. Yeah. With all that money. Well, women always lived a long time. Yeah. Women live a long time, yeah. Usually, yeah. Usually. We do live longer. Well, I mean, on average, they do live mm -hmm. longer. 
Um, so one of the recent books about Van Meegeren, and this, like I said, and I think I kind of like touched on this earlier, but particularly in regards to uh, the Supper at Emmaus, which was kind of like his best forgery, like the first big, like perfect forgery that he did. Um, this kind of, this book like brings up the question, like how could anybody have been fooled by this? Because like I said, it's not good. Like even if you've seen a handful of Vermeer's actual works, seeing this painting, you're just kind of like, mm, it just, it's, it's not it. Huh? It's just not it. Yeah. Like it's similar, but yeah. it, it very clearly looks like a fake, at least to me. I don't really know. Like it looks like a fake. It's not even the same thing. But like you said, I kind of feel like, I feel, I feel like there was kind of a thing going on at the period. Vermeer was very much a hot commodity at the time. He didn't have that many known works. People were looking to, oh, he must have painted more than 35 paintings in his whole because he lived a long time. So there must be more out there someplace. Um, so the market was primed for it. And I think, too, that the first one that he did was good enough that everybody's like, yeah, probably. Like, they did all the chemical tests on it. They're like, okay, that seems like a, you know, a real one. And then, like, as he started putting them out and they just weren't that good anymore and people were still falling for it, he's like, shit, man, I don't even have to put any effort into this crap anymore because they'll just, like, take any old shit that I right. crap out. And because I think at some point with the Plus critics... He was high. Well, that too. Yeah, yeah, well, I think yeah. at some point with the critics and with the people that were buying, like the collectors that were yeah. buying it, I think at some point they they got into like the sunk cost fallacy where they're just kind of like, well, I've, I'm already all in on this. And if I go back now and say, hey, these are all fake, I'm going to look like a yeah. tool. So they don't really want to do that. you got a situation where there's fakes in there that are accepted as real. And they say, well, this one looks like that one. And we are accepting that one as real. So this must be right. a real one too. But no. Yeah, I think it was just them kinda... all in a, If you looked at them all at the same time, you'd probably clearly delineate. You could see that there's a difference. Between I mean, if I showed that. you, and yeah. you probably, you don't know anything about it. It's like, because yeah. I actually do know a lot about Vermeer, about like Dutch art of this time period. Um, if I showed you like a, a handful of real Vermeers, and then I showed you a picture of this guy's thing, you would, I think you would immediately be able to pick out the one that was fake. Yeah. I think. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I don't know, but maybe we should do that experiment because I can, I, I'm sure I can tell because I, I, I think with, you I can, can tell with handwriting. I think you could probably tell. You're right. I mean, I, it, I just kind of feel like there's I a big can difference. can see the difference in what's called gestalt. Yeah. Between I think artists. you'd be able to tell. So I go, go no, nah, it's not the same. Slide. Like I said, Van Meegeren, it wasn't yeah. dumb and he was yeah. just kind of like, he did model his Vermeer, like, uh, Supper at Emmaus after a Caravaggio one because he posited that Vermeer had gone to Italy and studied the Caravaggio one. Caravaggio is another guy that we need to do a show about. That, that motherfucker, like, murdered a dude. He was a fascinating character also. Mm. But, um... <laughs> I wrote. I actually wrote, like, a like an illustrated novel. It's 8-12, and the hurricane hasn't hit us yet. Well, I said it's gonna be morning. Yeah, it's I not... It's The eye's not but gonna I be over we'd Orlando get, I until... I thought we'd have heavy, heavy winds by now. We had a little bit earlier, like I yeah. I heard it earlier, but yeah. I don't hear anything like right now, which is good because like the power stayed on. So are we pretty much done. Well, hold on a second, That's hold more. on. Okay. Like I got just like a couple more I seconds. I got too. Okay. okay, okay. But yeah, so like I said, I'll I'll show you the paintings and I'll see if you can. I bet you can okay. tell because there's I, to me there's like a big difference, but I don't know if that's just because I know a lot about that time period. Um, but so, uh, so yeah, so basically they did, um, in 1967, like a few years after they did, uh, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. They had a bunch of Vermeers in their collection and they were kind of like nervous about it. So they're like, maybe we should do like some chemical fucking tests on this now. And they confirmed that several of their paintings were in fact, probably fakes, uh, created in the 20th century. And they concluded that a lot of the Vermeers that they had were possibly Van Meegeren forgeries. Uh, the thing that mostly clued them in was the white lead. Uh, Vermeer did use white lead painting, like uh, paint for his white, but the chemical composition of it, uh, where the lead came from back in Vermeer's time is different to where the lead comes from nowadays. So that's usually, even if you can get everything else right, you can't get white lead from that time period anymore because the lead doesn't come from the place that it came from back then. So that's kind of like uh, one of the main things that they use to determine like that the shit is not from back then. They did some other scientific tests in 1977 on these same Vermeers and came to the same conclusion that they were fakes. Interestingly, and maybe a little bit ironically, 
Van Meegeren's own work rose in price after he became known as a forger, as I said, uh, and consequently came worth became worthwhile to fake his paintings. So now we actually have, it's like an Ouroboros of art forgery, where it's just kind of like, now we're forging the forger's paintings because his paintings are you know, well known. So now people are forging his. So uh, so some people have taken paintings that kind of look vermeer or look kind of like, uh, you know, old Dutch masters, but not really that good. And then we'll sign Han Van Meegeren's name on it and like try to pass it off as him and like sell it as that. So that's pretty funny. And like some people are doing some fakes, like new paintings in his style as well. Um, and they actually started doing that when he was alive. Interestingly, too, he also had a son named Jacques Van Meegeren, and he started faking his dad's work, too. Like, he would do paintings in his dad's style. They weren't as good. And he would uh, put his dad's, like, signature on them and try to pass them off as his. So it's like, I don't know why that was, like, so funny to me, but it's just like, he's spent his whole life, like, forging other people's shit, and now people are forging his shit, too. Uh, also, gotta say just the last thing, 2019, there was a movie that came out called The Last Vermeer, and this was actually based on the 2008 book, The Man Who Made Vermeers, which is by Jonathan Lopez, and actually Guy Pierce is in it. Uh, so actually, I kind of want to see that now. I didn't read that book, but I did read another one about Han Van Meegeren, which also came out in 2008, which is really, really good. Uh, it's called The Forger's Spell, a true story of Vermeer, Nazis, and the greatest art hoax of the 20th century. And that was written by Edward Dolnick. So I actually like really do recommend that. I've heard that The Man Who Made Vermeers uh, by Joseph, uh, Jonathan Lopez is also good as well, but I haven't read that one yet. But if you're interested in this guy, like seriously, like check out some of the books. And I want to see this movie too, like The Last Vermeer, because that sounds like really interesting as well so yeah i think that's we've wrapped it up right okay we have to wrap it up all america, right so american military 100 said it's asking if we're in the path of the hurricane yeah we are we're dead center. we are it's coming um, straight at us. yeah we're hopefully yeah it made landfall about four hours south of here on the coast mm -hmm. and so i'm kind of hoping that by the time it gets here that it will have weakened some yeah, oh, I know it will. It'll be about 70 mile an hour, maybe 80 mile an hour winds. Which is max. bad, that's, but not... That's not that bad. When it made landfall, it was like 155. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, Naples is fucking flooded. And what did we and say, around 8 o'clock in the morning? I think it's, yeah, it's going to be tonight, like... We got like a little bit of a band like yeah. earlier, like I heard it like blowing outside. Yeah. But 5 o'clock in the morning, we'll probably hear high winds. I would imagine, yeah. yeah. So, uh, look, let me get to go down there and start working on these damn pizzas you want okay. some because I, I gotta get rid of the uh the fresh mushrooms oh it's okay. a mushroom pizza i would you don't want some. any meat i got all no i don't know pepperoni no. okay all right you then. know you know how i feel I'll, about pepperoni. I'll, I'll divide it up we'll i just i want mushrooms and that's it okay go ahead and i'll, I'll go get that all right so hopefully everybody enjoyed the show i'm really glad we kept the power on the whole time like the weather held and i'm happy about it hopefully We'll let you guys know, like, what's going on. Hopefully, we'll be back on Friday night. Like, hopefully, the power won't go out for days and days because that would really suck. We do have generators, but I don't really know how it's going to go. But, yeah, we haven't really had the worst of the shit hit us yet. It's, good. it's supposed to, like, hit overnight. But I'm hoping that it'll weaken by the time it gets to us because we, we're about... I said earlier, but we're about 30-ish miles, like, north of Orlando. So we're still in the cone but the eye hasn't got here yet. I think the eye is supposed to be over Orlando tomorrow morning at eight in the morning. So we'll see how it goes. <sighs> I'm just, I'm hoping everything will be okay and it'll all work out. Uh, Tammy says, great show, Jenny. You two stay safe and hopefully see you on Friday. Thank you very much. Yeah, this was a, a topic that I've been wanting to do for a long time because I was, I don't know why, I just find this guy like really fascinating. So I'm glad that I finally got to do a show about him. Danny Rowling said, awesome show tonight. Thank you very much. Hopefully we'll be back on Friday evening. I'll keep you guys apprised of what's going on with the situation down here. Hopefully everything works out okay. But thanks for dropping by and thanks for hanging out with us on this Wednesday evening. We will see you guys hopefully again on Friday night. Good night.